down the start good evening everybody uh, this gives me immense pleasure and pride to welcome you all in this uh, fantastic session organized by west zone viva foxy in association with foxy and sub Hope Imaging Science Committee, Dr. Chajana Parmit, your academic partner, and uh, this uh, uh, panel PM, uh, has to be commended. It brings us all the knowledge which can really practical uh, uh, for our practice and uh, aptly as technology saves life. To begin with, we'll start with Saraswati Vandana. Dip, please. the uh, master of ceremonies. Now I invite uh, the first master of ceremony, Dr. Ansubha Shed, and it gives me pleasure to introduce her. Next. Uh, Dr. Basir is a con Arkas Hospital and Diagnostic Center Indoor. She has published papers in uh, national and inter international journals and co-authored the book Ultrasound for Beginners. She has co-authored chapters in the Foxy publication and has presented papers and posters at various national and international conferences. She has been awarded second prize in the paper present, first prize in the quiz in genetics in INHS Ashwini. She's an active member of the Fox C Young Talent Committee, and her areas of interest are ultrasound and endoscopy. Over to you, Dr. Anshu. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jayanta, for the uh, lovely introduction and the uh, Saraswati Vandana. So I would first of all like to thank Suffolk and uh, Veso Nuva Foxy for this opportunity. As we all know, we are here for the uh, work a workshop under the Imaging Science Committee and Suffolk. So without further ado, I am extremely pleased to introduce our uh, uh, conveners for today's programs. Can I have the slides, please? So our first convener for today is Dr. Archana Basir. Uh, yeah. She is a Vice President Foxy as the Organizing Chair Secretary for AICOG 2021 Indore. She is a Fellow Representative of AICC RCOG West Zone and Amazing Science Committee Chair. Uh, she is a very active member of Foxy. Uh, the next convener for today is Dr. Meenu Akrawal. She, can I have a CV here please? Yeah, she is a chairperson, Imaging Science Committee, Foxy, National Director, Clinical uh, Board of Morpheus IVF. She is an executive member of ISG. She has conducted many training courses, published in many journals and authors many books. So we are extremely delighted to have her here as a convener. I hand over the program to them for introducing the rest of the faculty you for uh, your kind introduction. I think Dr. Sham Desai, um, is he seen or shall, shall we just go ahead and Dr. Meenu will just wait for him and we'll introduce him when he joins in. So I'm just going to give you an overview of the program. At the outset, let me thank Safog, especially Professor Fardosi Begum and Professor Yusuf Latif Khan for uh, giving us permission to hold this workshop under the um, heading of uh, Safog and Foxy President Dr. Alpesh Gandhi and Dr. Jaydeepta for uh, you know saying that yes you can go ahead with this and let me congratulate um, our friends and colleagues in Bangladesh for uh, they are celebrating Safe Motherhood Day today and I think uh, it should be every day should be Safe Motherhood Day because we all are here for uh, making sure that our mothers and babies are safe and we are going to use technology to save lives. 
in today's program we have lined up stalwarts of uh, ultrasound in obstetrics and gynecology i have with me my dear friend dr sonal panchal who will be talking to you on gynecology recent advances in gynec ultrasound and dr anita kohl fetal medicine foundation india chair she will be talking on fetal interventions recent advances and we have an excellent panel which is moderated by my friend and my colleague dr uh, binu agarwal an imaging science committee chair as well as dr chinmay umar ji an excellent fetal medicine expert the panelists are very very you know like the shining stars dr narendra malhotra dr lubna hasan dr rubina sohil dr purab doraji dr reena wani dr mumtaz i think i think we are going to really have a good academic session and i would like to really thank uh, dr jayanta zana our academic partner for bringing us together and providing us this platform so i welcome you all on behalf of imaging science committee foxy imaging science committee sapog and foxy to this um, webinar on ultrasound in obstetrics and gynecology over to you dr meenu for your uh, comments um hello good evening everyone uh, and i bring greetings to you from imaging science committee foxy and this is going to be a good program huge credits to dr archana basher for actually uh, visual for you know putting up this program this thought behind it that let us put what is a new technology and how we can do better and better so um, uh, very very nice and i'm sure you're going to have a great time Uh, uh are we waiting for dr um, sham desai sir has he joined or not yet I all think, right okay i think dr meenu let's go ahead because right, right. Can, uh, and i'm very happy to have our friends uh, um, from pakistan and bangladesh and from safog uh, also as well from the you know um, uh, west zone and you are foxy so all of us have put our hands together and we are bringing a good program and i'm sure we will do um, uh, well and we will be giving lots of take home messages so i think we can start with the first lecture um uh, anshu or arti yeah i think i think let me introduce the chairpersons uh, mm -hmm. dr fardosi begum has just sent a message across that she is busy with uh, celebrating uh, safe motherhood day but uh, let me introduce her she is an excellent person i mean uh, she is a very down to earth person she is right now president of safog and president elect of uh, option gynae society of bangladesh she has so many awards to her credit that I, you know the one full day can go when i'll talk about her awards so thank you dr fardosi we will be waiting for you to join in the program and thanks for uh, giving the permission to hold this program and the next um, our chairperson is dr yusuf latif he is secretary general of safog again a very good friend he is a consultant gynecologist at hamid latif hospital lahore pakistan so dr anshu you can now introduce dr sonal panchal and we can start with our academic session can i have a slide please uh, so our first speaker for the day is dr sonal panchal uh, she is a consulted sono uh, sonography specialist at dr nagori institute of infertility and ivf ahmedabad professor dubronic international university croatia i was fortunate enough to have uh, attended her lectures before covid in person and her lectures are always so clear crisp they were very helpful in my postgraduate and mrcg preparation she is a master of ultrasound and obstetrics and gynecology at in ian donnell inter university school of medical and ultrasound so uh, without further ado i would like to hand over uh, the session to her to with uh, continue with her talk hello hello am i audible yes yeah, sonal you are audible thank you so much uh, anshu for those very kind words and before i start i must thank dr archana dr meenu very good friends both of them and thank you very much to the imaging science committee foxy and safo for giving me this opportunity 
to share my ideas and my images with you all. The topic today, again, is very interesting. As, as uh, I know, Arshna always brings something new to, to the, those old same, same old things, but presented in such a nice and a new way that you'd learn a lot more. And today's topic is advanced technologies in gynecological ultrasound. You all know that gynecological ultrasound took two large, two very huge leaps uh, in its history from the transabdominal scan to the transvaginal scan, and then transvaginal scan to the volume transvaginal scan. And this brought a huge revolution in the entire uh, field of gynec imaging. Introduction of the volume ultrasound has significantly increased the information available in gynecology. And the main advantage is the coronal section that we get of the pelvic structures, which otherwise was not possible whether we used transabdominal or transvaginal routes for scanning these patients. Other advances that came through were common because of combination with advances not only in the ultrasound scanning, but in the computer technology and in, of course, in the artificial intelligence. So it was the ultrasound technology which was progressing on one side. On the other side, it joined hands with the, the artificial intelligence and, and with the computer technology. And that made the entire difference in the imaging uh, field. And the outcomes were 3D rendering with HD live mode, silhouette mode, then the studio, the HD live studio, and the NGO mode, and the magic uh, which is um, uh, electronic scalpel. It's, it's called electronic scalpel also. And then omni view and contrast mode and elastography and so on. We've seen and a lot, lot more new things and softwares. Let's just quickly go through, uh, I mean, it's going to be an overview, but let's just quickly go through what all new things have brought to us into gynec imaging. We know that 3D is a modality of choice now for the diagnosis of Mullerian duct abnormalities. It is 3D rendering which can beautifully show the entire shape of the, the outer wall as well as the endometrial contour. And that helps, uh, uh, that makes the diagnosis, the differential diagnosis of all the duplication abnormalities so very easy and so very precise. We know that when we're talking about the Mullerian duct abnormalities, that's when we are chiefly talking about the contour of the serosa and the contour of the endometrial uh, cavity in, in the coronal planes. And based on those, whether we are using the old uh, uh, AFS uh, classification system to classify the Muller duct abnormalities, or we are using the new SRSJ classification, for both of, both the uh, uh, classifications, we are always using these two shapes, these two contours to differentiate. And these are best seen on ultrasound, not only on 3D ultrasound, not only that. When we are using HD Live, it makes much more clear appearance of the endomyal junction. It gives much more clearer idea about the tissue morphology. And therefore, these are the two technologies. Uh, this, this, is, this is the technology which is so very appreciated. And that has made 3D ultrasound a modality of choice, a gold standard for the diagnosis of duplication, differential diagnosis of duplication abnormalities. Very simple, if I just give you a few examples, we know that when we have an obtuse angle between the endometrial cavities, and cav the, the two endometrial uh, cavities, the dividing endometrial cavity, and we draw an intercornual line, and we measure the distance from the intercornual line to the deepest point on the endometrial deepest uh, uh, notch, that if, if this distance is less than 10 millimeters. And if the angle is obtuse, we know we are looking at an acute uterus according to the AFS system. According to the, the um, HRSG system, we do not take into consideration the absolute measurement. We don't look at the obtuse angle. We do not measure the distance of 10 millimeters, but then we will measure the myometrial wall thickness as it is done here from the intercornual line to the highest point on the serosa 
and we compare all the other wall thicknesses as compared to the myometrial wall thickness now if the deep tear is more than 50% of the myometrial wall thickness that's when we call it a septum according to Escher SJ but if it's AFS again we have to look at the angle between the two cavities if it is acute and if the distance from the intercornual line to that dip is more than 10 millimeters we would say it is a septum so whether you are using the AFS system whether you're using the Escher SJ system you want to use the both you want to combine the both in all these cases, it is the 3D ultrasound, which is which is most, most important, which is very user friendly and it gives us all the information that we require. Even when we are trying to compare the two systems, for example, when we are using AFS, we are talking about a bicoronate uterus and we are talking when we are using SRS, we are talking about a bicorporeal uterus and again, with the bicorporate uterus, we are going to measure the angle between the cavities and we are going to look at the depth of the deep and uh, on, on the external uh, contour, whereas when we are looking at the bicorporeal, that's when we are, of course, looking at the depth of the deep, but we are looking at the depth of the deep in relation to the myometrial wall thickness. And I'm not going to go into the details of that more, but that it, it is... It is the 3D uh, rendering HD live, which gives us beautiful idea about the shape of the endometrial cavity as well as the external contour, and therefore the definitive diagnosis. You can add magic to that, which makes the shape of the endometrium even more clear and very crisp. Adding silhouette mode to that would also allow you to look at the cavity characteristics and that's how you can use this technology to make your diagnosis more clear. You can also use the rotation mode along with your magic cut. And that will not only show you uh, the, the shape of the endometrial cavity and the, and, and the cirrhosal contour. It will also show you the cervical shape. And look how beautifully as if you are doing a, a, a perspiculum examination. So... That's, that's what the technology can do for you. Coming to the diagnosis of T-shaped uterus, which is so much confused, which has been always overdiagnosed, I would say any narrow uterus is called a T-shaped uterus, but it is SRSJ classification, which has made this much, much more clearer. And that's where we know that we can, if we can get a coronal image of the uterus and the right midline, mid, mid coronal plane, and we measure the myometrial wall thickness. And if we get a lateral wall thickness thicker than 1.4 times the myometrial wall thickness, that is a T-shaped uterus with a narrow cavity. If the lateral wall thickness is not thickened, it is not a T-shaped uterus. So that makes the diagnosis very, very clear. The only thing that is to be remembered is your section, your image should be correctly produced. And to do that, it is very essential that your viewing line of the 3D render box should absolutely overlap on the central line of the endometrial cavity, one. And two, when you do rendering all your three multiplanar images, the sagittal, the transverse, and the coronal should be true orthogonal planes. And then whatever shape of the uterus that you see is precisely correct. Coming to the different render modes, uh, especially highlighting the HD live mode, you can, if I mean, I have just put here two, uh, uh, two sets of images, two pairs, where the same uterus, the same, the same structure has been rendered in the surface mode and in the HD live mode and you can see how more precisely you can see the endomyo junction you can see how clearly you can see the muscle uh, the myo myometrial fiber arrangement and how beautifully you can identify any minimal irregularity of the endomyo junction and that's where the the uh, HD live helps not only not only for the shape of the uterus not only for the 
normal morphology. For example, I'm looking at endometrial pathologies like polyps, where I'm often confused if the polyp is large and it fills up the entire endometrial cavity. That's when you can just put, put a little bit of saline inside, the saline infusion sonography, and sonography. And with that, when you acquire a 3D image, you can beautifully see the fluid-filled cavity and the polyp popping out and just compare that with the hysteroscopy pictures. Absolutely comparable, absolutely same. And that's the amount of information that we can get for the endometrial lesions. Another endometrial polyp, it's a huge polyp. Put on a Doppler and you'll see the vascular pattern. And that confirms your diagnosis, yes, it's a single feeder, of course, it's branching inside, but it's a single feeder, so it has to be a polyp. And of course, when you put on, put in the saline inside and you do a saline infusion, the saline flows onto all the sides and that confirms your diagnosis of a polyp. Another comparison between a hysteroscopic picture and an, uh, a, a saline infusion, so, so no, saline infusion hysterogra uh, hysterography with the, uh, 3D imaging, look at the, the amount of simile between the two. You probably do not require to do a hysteroscopy just for a diagnostic purpose. And believe me, it's been more than 15 years now that we are doing any diagnostic hysteroscopies at our center. The diagnosis has to be done by your ultrasound and it's only for the operative cause that, I mean, operative reason that you would, therapeutic reason that you would you would do a hysteroscopy. You can actually produce a virtual hysteroscopic picture. Look at that. That is the actual picture. That is the actual picture on your coronal plane. Now you want to see as you are, as if you are looking on a hysteroscope from down to up, and that's how it happens. Look at that. You can actually move in, and you are entering the cavity, and you are seeing those multiple tiny polyps. It is. That is what we call virtual hysteroscopy. Even if it is a cervical lesion, you produce pictures absolutely similar to the first paculum examination, a large cervical polyp there. So that's, that, that's what uh, um, 3D can do. That's how you can use the technology for very precise diagnosis and avoid unnecessary operative, operative procedures. Another comparison of a hysteroscopy with a 3D ultrasound, so saline infusion, sarcomography, and look at the synecy that you are seeing there. It is for the therapeutic purpose that the scope was put in and the picture was just the same as you would see on the 3D ultrasound with saline infusion hysterography. Coming to fibroids, we know that fibroids are often confusing. Of course, uh, they are very simple, uh, to, uh, simple, to make, simple to make diagnosis fibroids, like which are clearly endometrial fibroids, as you can see here, or they're clearly intramural fibroids. There are some fibroids which are intramural, which are invading into the, into the endometrial cavity or they're grossly distorting the endometrial cavities. And that's where we are quite confused on the 2D ultrasound, whether we need to operate this or not, or what should be the operative route. And that's where the 3D is very, very helpful. Using HD Live with Silvet Mode beautifully because of the transparency, beautifully shows the entire margin of the endometrium, how much is the depth of the fibroid inside and how much is the fibroid outside the endometrial cavity. So this would have been the margin of the endometrial cavity. That's help you, that helps you show that it's more than 50% inside the endometrial cavity and probably operating it hysteroscopy maybe uh, hysteroscopically might might be a better way out and and uh, and so on so for 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 that naturally you would operate hysteroscopically so it gives you idea about exact location especially when there are multiple fibroids and we need to do fibroid mapping we know that when we are doing mapping we of course have to create a table and that's where we are going to measure the size of course you will write the size into three diameters i've just to save i mean make it a little less congested i've written only one diameter but otherwise you usually write three diameters you write the location you write the topography you write the depth so you write the type of the fibroid and everything and along with that it's very essential to give a diagram, a pencil diagram of mid plane, transverse plane and the coronal plane. And this 
can be precisely made if you are doing a 3D because there you have a multiplanar image where you can see all the three images. You just need to copy down. It's not an imagination. It's actually what you're seeing. It's, it's imagine. It's not an imagination. For example, that fibroid, which absolutely looks like intramural, but when you, uh, you just cut through it and it, that's where you would actually see, oh my God, it's actually impacting. It has a huge, it is causing, causing distortion of the endometrial cavity. And why did I not see here? Because when I'm doing a surface rendering, I'm just seeing on the green line, on the green line, on the viewing line of the box. But if I cut it, I'm seeing the larger part of the fibroid. And that's why I can exactly make out how much is the affection of the endometrium. So that's, that's where your technology helps. That's where we are using MagicCut along with the scenic calculation. Similarly here, a large fibroid looks like in the angle and it is this picture which confirms, yes, it's truly in the corner. And that is what is going to block the tube. Coming to adenomyosis, using HD live with silhouette mode, silhouette mode. And there is where you can actually see the endometrial eye lens into the myometrium. And that's, that's mind blowing. That's exactly what you would see on a cut section of the, you can see on the coronal plane, the invading endometrium into the myometrium, the strands and obliteration of the endomyojunction. You're seeing it here also. So it, it gives a precise idea. It is because of this, because it gives so, so clear idea about the endomyo junction. Therefore, 3D has been now considered at par with MRI for the diagnosis of adenomyosis also. Coming to the cervix, a perfect per vaginal picture, per speculum picture of the cervix. And even more than that, because you are not seeing here the lesions inside the wall, which you can see there very clearly. So fibroid, that's a picture of a cervical fibroid and cervical polyps. So again, this is HD live with silver mode. So using the technology in the correct way can give you very precise diagnosis and can, can, can decrease your confusions, can decrease your operative procedures, can improve the patient prognosis because if there is something which needs to be uh, dealt with very quickly, you, your diagnosis is more clear, more earlier, and therefore you can treat the patient on time, for example, even in, in the malignancies. Let's, let's move ahead a little. It, uh, it is, uh, I've already told you that it is a 3D ultrasound which has made uh, the, the diagnosis of adenomyosis as accurate as with MRI. Uh, being in perfect concordance with the hysteroelectroscopy, 3D ultrasound allows, uh, uh, it uh, avoids the need to endoscopy, uh, to do the endoscopy and differentiate, to differentiate between the different uterine abnormalities. Uh, it is HD live with silhouette, which beautifully shows the entire, uh, um, any foreign body in the endometrial cavity, you can make out what is the type of the intrauterine contraceptive device. And even if it is displaced, whether it is invading into the myometrium or not. Tubal lesions, of course, using inversion mode, which fills up the entire tube. It makes it solid and therefore easily identifiable. You can beautifully identify the waste sign of the hydrosalpings. So you can see the inner walls of the hydrosalpings, the irregularity of the inner walls. And that tells you whether it's an acute hydrosalpings, whether it's a chronic hydrosalpings. Theomasis, you can exactly identify the margins of the ovaries. So differentiate those, both are adherent. You can still differentiate between the tubal margins, the tubal lumen, the walls of the tubes, and of course, the exact margins of the, uh, of the ovary. Coming to the malignancies, where we need to specially identify the solid uh, projections, the papillarities, the margins of the solid mar uh, uh, papillarities, the septae, the thickness of the septae, the vascularity in the septum, these things are so beautifully and so clearly demonstrated on your 3D ultrasound. Of course, it's going to be much more complex and much more complicated on your 2D ultrasound. So that's, that's where your 3D helps. And you can pick up even small irregularities very early and that helps you early diagnosis of the malignancy and that saves lives. We know that ovarian cancers, the earlier they are diagnosed, better is the prognosis. Not, uh, moreover, uh, 
apart from just using hd light we can change the light source now when you are changing the light source that's when you are seeing see it's the same picture but you are seeing the septa much more clear you are seeing the heterogeneous equigenicity of the solid projections and that's how look at this 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 all these three pictures are the same patient same same lesion these are hemorrhagic cells you can see actually actually the degenerated blood the the morphology of the the contents and the tissue inside coming moving a little ahead ngo mode uh, we can actually produce angiography like pictures just by doing rendering you have acquired an image with a 3d with a power doppler a 3d volume with a power doppler and then when you render that's how you can clearly make out the density vascular density of a lesion you can make out that the density is heterogeneous you can make out that the same vessel has a different diameters you can make out that it is the same vessel which shows tumor lakes which shows uh, uh, connections between the arteries and the veins look at that net uh, closely knit pattern and sometimes it also happens that images i mean the the lesions which look very very simple i mean very very benign looking they actually when you put on your color doppler when you put on your power doppler 3d power doppler that's when you realize the vascularity is really really angry it's it's too much and this is a very high chance of malignancy malignancies can be identified on 3d power doppler by the typical vascular architecture which includes one irregularity of the uh, of the diameter or asymmetry of the diameter well, micro aneurysms you can see all these things your micro aneurysms asymmetry of the uh, diameter of uh, of the um, uh, a single vessel then you are seeing tumoral lake you see multiple vessels mix uh, joining each other so av malformations and this is only possible by 3d now this is something this is a very personal and a very important message that i want to give you remember if you are seeing a post menopausal patient even if you have a normal sized ovary 2 cc or 2 and a half cc in volume you must put on a doppler you put on a doppler and if you see vascularity do a 3d power doppler if you have a ri of less than 0.4 and on your 3d power doppler if you see a typical irregular asymmetrical diameter of the vessel and microaneurysms this is when you can make the earliest diagnosis of malignancy and this is my self experience i have been doing this since more than 15 years now and have been able to save several lives when the vascularity is more it's more likely to be a uh, uh, white spread and it it may also have metastatic tumors you can also use contrast you have ultrasound uh, contrast uh, which is the the commonest brand which is available in india is sonoview which is marketed by breco and it's very very important because if you use contrast and then you do a 3d power doppler that's when you can make out you can you can identify smallest vessels and therefore pick up the tumor vascularity at the earliest the same contrast we are also using for the tubal assessment and these are not laparoscopic pictures these are 3d icosis and you can beautifully see the endometrial cavity that's the balloon of the follicles you are seeing the entire tubal lumen and the fimbrial details that you see is is unbelievable you cannot see with any other technology so that's that's what is the beauty of 3d hypoxy you can absolutely replace you will not believe this but i have not done any hsgs for more than 20 years now and we do laparoscopies only when we find abnormalities blockages uh, late spills in the 3d hypoxy so these are all 3d hypoxy pictures beautiful delineation of the entire tubal as well as the fimbria and that's that's a distal hydrosalpix 3D hypoxy has much more sensitivity and specificity when when the uh, results are compared with the laparoscopy as compared to the 2D hypoxy. You can see the entire endometrial ca uterine cavity, tubes, whole tubal lumen can be seen. Shortens the procedure, decreases the patient's discomfort. It has no side effects, and 
um, the spill is much better appreciated. You can also, instead of HD light, try power Doppler. So that's a power Doppler hypothesis, 3D power Doppler hypothesis. And again, with that also, you can see the entire uterine cavity and the entire tubal lumen and the spill there. One more image. So you can use that also. So 3D has an applicability there too. If you cannot do rendering, if the image quality is not good, if the endometrium is very thin, then use OmniView. And that is where you just have to draw a line across a particular plane that you want to see the orthogonal plane of, and it will show you. So for example, if I'm seeing a sagittal plane and I'm drawing an MNU view, I'll get a, a coronal image of the same, and that's, that's a cervical pregnancy, that's a normal uterus. You can use OmniView with what is called VCI, so a thicker slice, that's why you're seeing the second dotted line, and that improves the contrast. For example, that's a didelphus uterus that you're seeing with OmniView. And of course, when the uterus surface, the uterus endometrial cavity is very curved, it, it has multiple curves, that's when you have to use OmniView. You can use multiple lines at a time. You can use elastography. And elastography, of course, we know has an applicability for differentiating between malignant and benign lesions, but it also has a role in differentiating between fibroids, which are firm lesions and appear blue, whereas adenomyosis, which are softer lesions and appear blue, green, uh, green, yellow. Similarly, you can use the elastography for the scars. When you, when you doubt a weak scar, that's when you can again use elastography. But if the elastography shows blue color, that means it's just a fibrotic tissue and it's not a weak scar. But if you instead see a red line, a red color inside, that's when you know that it is, it is a weaker scar. We may see, yeah, that's a, that's a red color inside and that's a weaker scar. So you can use elastography for the scar assessment too, apart from the rendering. Quickly going to the volume calculations. That is very, very important for the precise volume calculations. That's where you require 3D, you can acquire a volume after you have acquired a volume to calculate the exact volume of that structure, of the desired structure. That's when you use vocal. Vocal is rotating the entire volume 180 degree. You can select different steps of rotation and here I've selected 30 degree. So I'll have to do six rotation. Every rotation I'm drawing a line. I'm, I'm demarcating the organ of interest. And at the end of six rotations, I will beautifully see the entire ovary. This is an ovary in measurement, so over, ovary scooped out. And then you can, you can do n number of measurements with that. You can measure the stromal flow. You can measure the vascularity in the entire ovary, in the globe, and, and so on. Uh, we, we'll just go, to, go, to go through that. I'll just run the clip a little faster. Yeah, so you have the entire ovarian volume scooped out. Then you can also do, a, a, once you have, entire ovarian volume scooped out. The moment you press on the knob called volume histogram, that's where you get 3D power Doppler parameters, vascularity index, flow index, and the vascularity flow index, which tell you about the abundance of the flow, the average intensity of the flow, and the perfusion in the entire globe, respectively. And that information is very, very important. Now, where do we use this information? Of course, we use it in infertility. We use it for PCO patient, but we also use it for the malignant, malignant lesions. It's very, very important that when you are treating malignant lesions with chemo or radiotherapy, it's the vascularity which decreases first. And after that, that the size of the lesion decreases. So you can know that the size of the lesion is decreasing after six to eight weeks, but you can make out the vascularity decreasing as early as about the end of two weeks. And therefore you can much more earlier make out whether the treatment that you're giving is working or not. And that is a boon because you can add things or you can change the line of treatment. Then coming to the assessment of the, I mean, then using threshold volume. Now, what is this threshold volume? The moment you switch on the threshold volume, you'll see the pigment on, the, uh, on all the three uh, sections, so on the volume. And this pigment, the threshold can be adjusted so that the pigment fills up only the fluid filled areas or the less ecogenic tissues, or it should extend even up to ecogenic tissues. So that threshold is usually adjusted. I mean, it's usually used to differentiate between the content, between the amount of the 
fluid filled areas and the uh, the solid areas it can be used for the diagnosis of uh, pco to to establish stromal abundance it can be used in malignant lesions to differentiate between how much is the solid content how much is the fluid content so that's that's how we use it you can also use it for endometrial lesions so that's that's where we use what is called threshold volume and you get the volume of the for example here i've tried to measure the stromal volume so the above threshold volume is the volume of the non-pigmented area and the below threshold volume is the volume of the pigmented area so we can differentiate between the follicular volume and the stromal volume and excess stromal volume tells me it's pco more than 75 percent when there is a stromal volume that's when it's a likely it's likely to be lh uh, uh, excess and therefore it is uh, a polycystic uh, patient polycystic ovary patients. Stromal hypertrophy is recognized as a frequent and a specific feature of ovarian androgenic dysfunction and three-dimensional ultrasound has potential to address these points and improve the sensitivity and specificity of the diagnosis of PC. You can also correlate this stromal volume to not only the androgen levels, but also to the insulin levels. And thus, just looking at the stromal volume, you can identify the patients with insulin resistance. Then to, to count the number of antral follicles and the count uh, and measure the size of individual antral follicle, of course, when the antral follicle number is too high, that's when, when you scroll across, you cannot count the number of antral follicles correctly. But that is when we use 3D with Sono ABC, which color codes each and every fluid filled area. And that is why it identifies each and every follicle. And then it gives you X, Y, Z diameter, mean diameter, and volume of each and every follicle. And thus, it decreases, it saves your time of examination and still gives you much more precise information. If you are only concerned not about all the follicles, just about the enteral follicles, okay? I just want to know how many follicles smaller than nine millimeters or how many follicles between six and nine millimeters. I can use a special software, which is called Sony AVC Antral. And that would identify only a particular size of follicles. And for example, here you are identifying six to nine millimeter and less than six millimeter size follicles separately. Or you can also use HD Live at Silvet to render those images and beautifully see the, the follicles and the arrangement. You can also use the same Sony VC not only to count the enteral follicles, but also before, also before giving a trigger IVF patient, multiple follicles, you cannot count them all because the shapes are irregular because they're all compressed by each other. In this case, as you can use Sono AVC antral again, you can also use Sono, sorry, that's why you use Sono AVC follicle. Now, when you have any other fluid field structure, whether it's fetus or it is gynecology, whether it's endometrial cavity or it's a hydrosalpin, you can, or it's a gestational sac, you can use Sono AVC everywhere. And you can use Sono AVC general to calculate the exact volume for the, for the loculated fluid in the peritoneal cavity. That's where you can use Sono AVC and find out the exact volume. Um, you can also use the vascularity measurements. You can subjectively see whether the ovarian vascularity more or less, and that is helpful because less vascularity means less responding, higher doses of gonadotrophin is required for stimulation, where more vascularity usually seen in PCO patients, less doses of stimulation are required. You can use this to evaluate the follicular quality better because more vascularity, more uniform the vascular development around the follicle, better is the quality of the follicle and better is the chance of pregnancy. You can actually not just subjectively see it, you can also measure it quantitatively by the same vocal that I told you. After vocal, we use what is called a shell volume and that's where we can calculate the perifollicular VI, FI, and VFI, and adding those parameters of VI 6 to 20 and FI more than 35 to the follicular Doppler parameters helps to improve the pregnancy results. You can measure, the, do the vocal and measure the size of the preovulatory ovary itself, the entire ovary. And if the total ovarian volume is more than 180 cc, both ovaries together, the chances of OHSS are significantly higher. But if the size of ovary, both ovaries together is less than 110 cc. The chances are extremely low, no matter what is the size of the, what are the number of medium-sized follicles, no matter what is the age and the BMI of the patient. Similarly, for the endometrium, 
Now we are measuring endometrial volume rather than the endometrial thickness, and it's considered to be much more reliable parameter to produce pregnancy. Of course, you can also evaluate the endometrial global vascularity by 3D power doppler. The applications are innumerable. If there is a limit to your imagination, there can be a limit to imagine and use 3D ultrasound. Thank you very, very much for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you. That was an amazing, amazing talk and brilliant images. You know, you feel as if you are in some 3D uh, theater watching some nice, uh, you know, sci-fi movies. So thank excellent. You. And <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. There are a few questions. Um, can we, Dr. Gautam Reddy is asking, can we use the term borderline polycystic ovaries? Uh, there's no term like borderline polycystic ovaries. It's either polycystic ovaries or it's not polycystic ovaries. And uh, we already know the criteria, 10 cc and or uh, 20 follicles per ovary. And that's, that's it. Of course, we can add a stromal, um, a stromal abundance to this. But you don't call then borderline. You mention that the stromal abundance is seen and therefore the, it's possibility LH is excess and therefore patient may have polycystic ovarian syndrome, but that ovary is polycystic according to definition only if it's 10 cc and 20 cc. Sometimes we do find a PCO pattern in one ovary, but the other ovary does not show a PCO it's pattern. It's polycystic ovarian syndrome. I mean, it's still a feature of polycystic ovarian right. Okay. Then there is another question again by Dr. Gautam Reddy. Is there an entity called fibroadenosis in the uterus? It's not actually fibroadenosis, but often you would see adenomyosis and fibroids together. And that's where there are some people who use that terminology, but it's not a formally and widely used terminology. Lots of compliments to you uh, in the question answer as well as in the chat box. And again, one more question, 20 follicles by Sono AVC, somebody's asking. So 20 follicles by Sono AVC, no, it's not necessarily so. You can even scroll across and if you can count 20, but, and, and you can usually count 20, that's not a problem. Only when you want to accurately find out exactly how many, that's when you require a Sono AVC. And that is what is, often required because when there is a PCO patient there are multiple follicles, you are concerned as to how many follicles you'll get at the end of stimulation. And there are some studies which have shown that you get 60% of what you have counted as enterals. So that's why it's important to know how many. Okay. And the last Sona, question, an amazing talk as usual, Thank mesmerizing. Thanks. So I think, I, uh, I think there are many questions, so you can just answer. Last question, can we take one more question? Yeah. Uh, how yeah. common is a completely calcified wall in a simple cyst of ovary? Completely calcified wall in a simple cyst? No, we will not call it a simple cyst anymore because when there is calcification, it's not simple anymore. There would have been an inflammation and that would have been followed by calcification or it's not truly a, a, a simple cyst or an inflamed cyst at all. It might be a dermoid. Yes, Dr. Archana, please go ahead now. Yeah, I think Dr. Anshu has to introduce Dr. Anita Cole and uh, we go ahead with the next talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sonal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to, so our next talk is on uh, the advances in technology in fetal interventions. So, and who better to uh, talk on this uh, topic than Dr. Anita Cole. She is uh, the Fetal Medicine uh, Foundation Chair, currently Clinical Coordinator for Apollo Center of Fetal Medicine Delhi, Director of Apollo Cradles uh, Delhi NCR. She's even an examiner for the Fetal Medicine Foundation. So we would uh, like, um, we are extremely delighted to have her talk about this very upcoming topic and the new, new technologies that have come up. Uh, over to Dr. Anita. Thank you so much, uh, Anshu. And indeed, thank everyone from the UR Foxy, the
the SAFOG, my, my colleagues, Minu and Arshna from the ultrasound course that we run for Foxy, and um, the very beautiful MOCs. It's nice to see these young, bright faces. So, so thank you for introducing me. Um, as, as Sonal said, this indeed is a is an interesting concept, and I, I have to think about how to put things together. So what I thought is that because the audience is mainly obstetricians, that perhaps I need to give you all an overview where things are in the fetal medicine intervention field. Um, there are some procedures that we do and some we don't. Uh, but I thought that for, for the audience, it's important to know what's happening um, in the speciality at the, pres at the present time. So historically, fetal therapy started with Lily and the blood transfusions, and then it moved on to hysterotomy. So what happened with Michael Harrison and a group in San Francisco, which you know that they would physically open up the, the uterus and um, d you, you know expose the baby and treat it for whatever it is. And I'll show this to you in a minute. Um, then it went on to sort of non-invasive procedures, more like fetoscopic procedures, and this is primarily used in all the twin complications. And then also the image-guided percutaneous procedures, which is more ultrasound-based because that's the access is even uh, smaller. And now we've, of, of course, got new instruments coming into the specialty, um, such as radiofrequency ablation. So I think the the, the fact, um, as, as Sonal said, there's been such a development in ultrasound that has really helped. But what has also helped is the, the instrumentation. So I think our field has moved forward because the instrumentation which has gone um, into the field has has been so 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 great. Um, the common procedures which I thought I'll touch upon because it's impossible in in the time that we have and uh, that that we talk about every intervention, but at least these things which are fairly common, I thought that we should uh, talk about. So let's start with the placenta because that is indeed what is the most important thing. Uh, the angio architecture of the uh, the, the placenta and particularly, I would probably say like two thirds of the procedures that we do are in multiple pregnancies and in particular monochorionic twins. So what they have is that they have both the fetal circulations connected together and it could either be an arterial arterial connection, it could be a, a venous connection or it can be an artery to vein con uh, connection. And that is what causes the problem. So if you have a, a connection, whether it's superficial or whether it's deep, where you have a unidirectional blood flow, this results in one baby giving its blood to the other one. And it results in this thing that we call as twin to twin transfusion syndrome. And so for, for all of us in a pre-conference workshop on ultrasound, we really must try and identify these, uh, the, these uh, uh, pregnancies. So the, the donor twin, the one who's giving all its blood, very logically becomes very small. It is like a, you, you know, a FGR, a growth restricted baby. And the baby which is receiving all the blood um, becomes much bigger. What is the classic sign is this very large bladder that the, the because the, there's so much hyperdynamic circulation that the baby pees more and therefore there's polyhydramnios and there's a large bladder. Unlike the donor, which there's decrease in renal perfusion, the amniotic fluid sort of uh, decreases and we can see no bladder. So, um, Quintero tried to classify these changes because it's important for us to know when to intervene. So I'm not going to tell you about the Quintero classification, but suffice it to know that when you are following up twins, what you're looking for is a discordance in amniotic fluid. So if the discordance gets more and there is polyhydramnios and the other one is oligo and we use two and eight as cutoffs, 
we uh, stage that we call it as stage one and we just wait and watch because only about 20% of these stage ones then go on to stage two. So a, a lot of them just sort of stay like this for, for a very long time. But when it goes on to stage two, that means that you can see the large bladder as we saw in the cine loop that I was telling you, or that there is absent bladder um, in, in the donor twin. This is classified as stage two, and this is where you need to intervene and you need to do a laser photocoagulation so that you can separate out the two. Um, so in essence, what you're trying to do, as you can see in this figure, is you've got this small stuck baby. So you know that on the placenta, you have all these um, vessels going from one to the other. So you identify the arteriovenous connections and then try and laser them. Um, all the time, you need to have an ultrasound with you because to know where you are in the uterus is, is actually you, you need ultrasound to tell you that because the point is, which is the sort of uh, Achilles heel of every fetal procedure is the fact that there's a risk of preterm delivery. So the aim is to keep these instruments as small as possible. And if you're trying to keep your instruments as small as possible, for instance, a straight, uh, as a straight fetoscope can only be about one, one mm, you can barely see that the area your field of vision is actually very small. So other than having imaging, you need to have the laparoscope and you need to have a laser unit. So the first thing is to actually map the abdomen. Uh, you need to know where the placenta is so that you, you make sure that you don't um, come into the abdomen through the placenta. Uh, it's tense, you know, the procedure is done generally after IV sedation. Um, but we prefer actually just local anesthesia because oftentimes you need to ask the patient to move, turn on your left, turn on your right. We use a diode laser, we use the store scopes. You tend to have a sort of armamentarium of scopes because you want to, uh, you know, change if a posterior placenta, it's a different scope to an anterior placenta. You need to have enough of an irrigation setup because your views are very bad. So unless you have uh, continuous irrigation, you, you know, the, the amniotic fluid can look really murky and you cannot see anything. And of course, uh, tocolysis and antibiotics are important. So this is the range of scopes. As, as I said, the technology and the progress is in the instrumentation. As you can imagine, you need to, you know, these are very dedicated people because the number of, um, unlike a routine laparoscope and a hysteroscope, which is used so commonly around the world, they don't actually sell a lot of these instruments. And therefore to constantly um, do the R&D for it so that you move forward is really a commitment uh, by the company. So this, this curved scope is for the anterior placentas and the straight integrated scopes are for the posterior placentas. And sometimes we use this, uh, the trocar as well, um, to kind of look at the direction of where the placenta is. So just to show you, the, the, the theater has to have your ultrasound machine. It, um, and, and the things that we do are much like the laparoscopist, that you have to have your mind balance. You use, we use the stack that the, um, our gynae colleagues use. And of course, the third thing that you need to have is the uh, the the laser. Um, so I don't know. We'll eventually get to it. Oh, sorry. So uh, so you can see over here uh, the instruments. You know the the scopes are such that you keep a couple of them on the on the table. You need to make sure you have a bipolar because sometimes if by chance. Um, there is bleeding, you need to have the bipolar to correct it. And this is the laser that you have. Um, the first thing is, of course, like anything else, you check your instruments, you make sure the, the laser fiber goes right through the scope. These are, as I said, the integrated scope. So one of them would have the water irrigation channel and uh, one would have the laser fiber going through it. 
The second thing which is very important is that the first thing, uh, as, as soon as you enter the abdomen, which you use uh, 18 gauge needle is to take out amniotic fluid for carrier typing, because you always make sure that you, you test genetically. As I said, the most important thing here is that you shouldn't cause preterm delivery. And therefore we don't tend to do a direct trocar insertion. We tend to use the Seldinger's technique that you first uh, you use the, uh, the wire and then introduce our, um, we use the Cook's trocar. We don't, we prefer not using the metal trocars. Um, so you, you kind of gradually open up and gradually separate out the membranes. So we think it's less traumatic and therefore the chances of PROM and um, uh, you know, the, the woman going into preterm labor is less uh, because there's no point in you having done a successful procedure and then you end up, you know, she goes into labor. So here, after you've done that, one is introducing the scope um, which is fairly sort of, you know, straightforward and you're watching thing again, where it differs from our gynae colleagues is that the um, eyepiece is quite remote. So as you see that the scope and the ultrasound has to go together because the view that you have is really small. So this is uh, when you enter the placenta. So what I'm seeing here is, is the umbilical cord, which is coming in the way. I can see the placenta on the far side and I can see the, the vessels crossing each other. But, but the key thing is to see which are the vessels, which are the AV, because you don't want to um, uh, coagulate the arterial arterial ones, the ones which actually supply blood to the, to the baby, because you may end up um, with the IUFD because of that as well. And then once you've actually once you've actually um, uh, uh, checked the, the the direction of the uh, vasculature, then you just laser it as as we are doing over here. You just burn it so that the uh, that there's no blood supply going through, and you do it from one end of the placenta to the other. Um, So I always think that uh, fetoscopic surgery is really like, you know, the blind man and the elephant because you cannot see the entire picture. What you have to do is see parts of what you see because your, your view is so small. And that's why using the ultrasound, using the scope is you kind of work your way around and work out and see that, okay, this is, these are the vessels which need to be lasered and you sort of slowly go from one to the other. You cannot just, just use the laser alone. And not only is it important to do the laser, but it's also important to make sure that you do a, a proper follow-up. Um, we also tend to do a fetal MRI six weeks after the procedure because we think it's important no matter how well you do it, there is a risk, a very small risk of uh, is ischemic brain damage. So we want to be sure that even if the ultrasound is looking fine, that there's no problem as far as this is concerned. So we do that. And at the end, after the woman has delivered, always make sure that you get hold of the placenta and actually see what were the anastomosis and what did you laser. So I feel that the role of the obstetricians in twin pregnancies, and I'm really quite sort of clear about this because it is a problem we face, is that they must insist on knowing the chorionicity of the scan. We still have sonologists who write that it's a twin pregnancy, and we don't have enough who write that it is a dichorionic or a monochorionic pregnancy. Anyone, as soon as the obstetrician at her 12 week or uh, earlier scan, as soon as she knows it's a MCDA twins, the protocol of following this pregnancy is very intense. It has to be every two weeks because you cannot afford to miss um, uh, you know, uh, twin to twin transfusion syndrome. And if by chance, and this is unfortunately what we see that because the follow-up hasn't very, been very good, that there is a, a fetal demise. And if there is a fetal demise, the next thing that the obstetricians do is deliver the baby. And that is the worst thing that they can do. They have to wait because if there's fetal demise, there is a chance that this other baby has had 
you know, there's a 25% chance that the other baby, the co-twin can have neurological abnormalities. And therefore it is important that you leave that baby in there and check that there is uh, nothing like that because obviously you don't want to give the woman one dead baby and one baby which has got neurological handicap. So these are the nice guidelines, uh, the, the guidelines, I mean, the recommendations. And as you can see, I know it's intense, but that is the correct thing to do. The obstetricians must insist on a proper follow-up. Um, and this is the scan because that only can you see the changes. So moving on from uh, twins, the other thing that um, a lot of uh, development has happened is in the diaphragmatic hernias. Now, what is important from the ultrasound point of view is to predict which are these babies, when you see a diaphragmatic hernia, which are these babies who will have a good prognosis and which are the ones who may have not such a good prognosis and the ones who don't have such a good prognosis can we offer them fetal intervention? And the thing that we use is something called the observed to expected lung uh, head ratio. This is the, this is the measurement that we uh, use to grade these diaphragmatic hernias into the mild, moderate, severe, and extremely severe variety. And how do we do that? Is by doing the head circumference and in a four chamber view, wherever the four chamber view is, wherever you see, uh, you know, that that is the herniation, is that you, the, the lung tissue, which is there, you sit there and measure it. So you can, you know, there, there are a variety of ways you, you can do a, a AP and a transverse uh, measurement, but the, the best is to do the circumference. And then once you have that, derive a ratio. What we use is this total trial calculator because all the work which has happened as far as diaphragmatic hernia is concerned, where all the development of the tools is concerned, has started from Leuven with Professor Jan Depressed. And so uh, once you have your head circumference, you add it, the gestational age, you have it, you talk about what uh, the formula and I said the drop down menu shows you that have you used the circumference or the AP. I mean, you can see it over here. You can measure it either like this or the circumference or the AP uh, method. And this will then calculate out the percentage. And then based on the percentage that you get, if it is the observed to expected is more than 45, then the outcomes tend to be very good. And if it is not, then they have the option of perhaps considering um, fetal therapy. And what is the fetal therapy? The fetal therapy is because we've learned over uh, looking at lambs that whenever you block the trachea, because as you know, there's a lot of lung, uh, there's a lot of fluid production in the, in, in the lungs, um, uh, particularly in fetal light. So if you block the trachea such that this fluid doesn't come out, then the fluid keeps accumulating and accumulating within the lungs and it stretches out the lungs. Because the main problem in diaphragmatic hernias is the fact that the herniated contents cause uh, uh, pulmonary hyperplasia. So you need a technique where the lungs still expand in utero and such that once the baby is delivered and you correct the hernia, at least you have decent lung tissue for this baby to survive. So again, there is a scope. And uh, here, because of the, the, the way the, um, the neck is, you need to introduce it through an uh, introducer. And uh, these are instruments to remove the balloon. So essentially, what happens is that uh, th this is put through and the scope is introduced over here so that you go into the lung past the epiglottis, past the vocal cords and put a balloon in there. And this balloon occludes the trachea and you leave this balloon in for six weeks. And then after six weeks is over, you again go through and um, use this instrument and pull out the balloon. Because if this woman delivers and you have a trachea which is occluded, obviously this baby is going to die. So either if they go into preterm labor and the balloon has not come out, either, you know, the, the woman is delivered 
and she's kept on, um, uh, it's an exit procedure that the woman is still kept on the, the, the placenta. The placenta is not separated out. So the neonatologists have time to uh, remove this. And um, this is a video that uh, Professor Jan de Press shared whereby you are seeing the scope. So uh, you saw it in Twin to Twin, but here you're seeing the scope go into the fetal mouth and past Sorry, sorry. Past the uvula and uh, so forth. Let me it here and go forward a little bit faster. Um, go, go into it. Go into the mouth until you go past the vocal cords and come, come in such that um, you can. Um, uh, you can you can um, uh, get the balloon and you can sit there and inflate the balloon. So these balloons are also, you know, specially made for this procedure. And essentially, what we are seeing over here is the balloon needing to get inflated over here. And then coming out and leaving the balloon in. But the point is that six weeks later, when you come out, um, and this is a clip which is showing in there, I've just sort of run it back to back, is that you have to go in again and grab the balloon and pull it out so, so that when the baby is born, that there isn't uh, occluded lungs. And as I said, there, there are very good results with this. Um, the other thing that is there, I mean, uh, is, is this very spina bifida repair. So what was really, what happened in the US and uh, the, again, the pioneers of this procedure is the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. They found that they were delivering like 200 neural tube defect babies that women with neural tube defects wanted to continue. And they, they had uh, 200 babies with spina bifida. And they felt that this was not right. Um, and they therefore, because it, it, the, the main destruction in spina bifida is because of amniotic fluid. So the baby remaining inside for such a long time um, with uh, being exposed to the amniotic fluid, which is quite uh, uh, quite destructive to the neural tissue. This was the problem. So they decided that no, they need to do an in utero procedure whereby you repair the defect inside and let the woman come through. So this, um, and uh, this was a seminal paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011 and um, they got funding from the NIH and they absolutely proved, I mean, this trial was stopped um, midway because they realized that the, the benefit was so much that there was a reduced need for ventricular sh uh, shunting. There was a reduced instance of neurological effects. There was improved ambulation and there was reversal of this hindbrain herniation. Now, because we don't do it, I think um, in India, we, of a termination. I thought this is a short Fetal video, surgery for spina bifida is an incredibly surgery. complex procedure. At Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where the surgery was developed, a team of more than 20 people are in the operating room. They include up to four fetal surgeons, one neurosurgeon, two anesthesiologists, a maternal fetal medicine specialist, a fetal cardiologist, and specialized nurses. They have performed this procedure more than any team in the world. We are not seeing the video on the Mother receives audio. deep uh, anesthesia. Now? Fetal no, there is no video. There is only audio. Make an incision across the mother's. Okay. I don't know. I don't know how to. Okay. So maybe I'll try at the end. Um, you're not seeing my slides Amen. or? The maternal fetal sorry. medicine specialist no uses no ultrasound to determine the position of the okay, fetus so and the margins. Figure this out and um, show it a bit later, I think. So, so the point over here is that 
they, uh, and I wish I could have shown it to you, I'll try and figure out how to do it, but it's literally, they open up the mom, they use these very, um, they, well, I mean, they open up the uterus, have the baby with the back up, the neurosurgeons then repair the defect, they close the uterus, they, you know, put back the amniotic fluid, they close the uh, uterus and the woman goes on and eventually she has a cesarean section and, and, and the results are so good. Um, I know of, um, uh, in, in Bombay, I remember uh, Wadia had done a workshop and they'd called some people from across that, you know, should we be developing this technique also in India? But, but my thoughts were that at the moment, because we, we terminate and, and, and I know of people, I mean, in, in the West, every child, every life is important. So they feel that they should um, give every woman, you know, a chance to have a baby if she wants to continue. But I think we are a long way away from there. But I think it was important for you to know that how much um, fetal intervention has gone through. So this is a trap uh, sequence. I'm going to now come back to the sort of uh, smaller procedures which we do in India. This is a trap sequence. The problem is that they get missed. They, I mean, for some reason, uh, even in the first trimester scan, very few traps get picked up. Either it's thought to be like a vanishing twin or uh, it's it's not picked up. But essentially what it is is, is that it's an acardiac fetus and um, the healthy fetus supports it. So in this case, they come to us quite late. They'd come at 25 weeks and, and uh, so forth. So in these, what we want to do is that, that um, the vessel, which is connecting both of them together, we want to stop the blood supply, uh, which is this vessel, which is going to the healthy twin um, we want to stop it so it no longer supports it. And uh, one of the instruments or one of the techniques we use is this radio frequency ablation. And this has become very popular. Um, essentially, it was used a lot in uh, liver metastasis. So it's been around. But the application of using it um, in, in, uh, feet, in, in prenatal has come in recently. So when you open up this needle, it looks like this, and essentially you grab the uh, the vessel within the prongs, and you can sit there and um, you know uh, stop the blood supply. So this is more an image guided procedure. So it's an image guided percutaneous procedure. Everything has to be done under ultrasound, um, and you know you introduce and. you can see here and then you deploy it you do the laser and then your target which you pick up by ultrasound you open up the prong such that it is within that and then you just use radio frequency so that the heat is generated and that vessel is uh, coagulated um it it takes a, i mean you can see it's a bit in close up over here that the prongs are being opened up. Obviously, once you're inside, you have to switch off the color because it interferes with the heat and it causes problems. But essentially, these are the three prongs. You can see that they've opened, opened up. And uh, with your imaging that one has done before, you can make out that um, this was where the vessel was and uh, it, it works in that. Um, the other image guided procedure is shunts. So in this particular case, she came actually quite late with pleural effusion. Um, there, are, uh, uh, the, there are these shunts whereby you, you have these reusable introducer sets, you have these pigtail um, uh, catheters, and the aim is to, and uh, you know, the, the correct one to use are these rocket uh, fetal bladder catheters, but they are also used in the thorax. So as you can see over here, this end goes into the baby. This end goes against the wall of the chest and holds it inside. The wire keeps the memory um, there. So as soon as you pull out the, the wire, the memory 
of this is lost. So really you need to do the, as, as soon as you open up the packet, you need to do, finish off the procedure within half an hour or so, otherwise the memory goes. And uh, again, it's an image guided procedure. This tends to be a little bit more, I mean, your heart is in your mouth a little bit more because the heart is there. And once you put in that metal troca and uh, these babies inevitably have polyhydramnios because uh, the, the, the the esophagus is um, you know is obstructed and so as soon as you push this catheter and you put in the troca that baby moves away so it is quite tricky to get it inside and then deploy the catheter such that the the one end of the shunt is inside and the other one is out from the chest and um, you know, this is the extra fluid coming out. So in summary, just to finish off, I do think that fetal interventions has moved forward. There's been a lot of development of um, instrument. Um, there's more knowledge, the ultrasound machines being as good as they are, help us see much more. But I do think that the main handicap is the lack of, uh, knowledge that the obstetricians have and or indeed even if they know that how do they go about referring it to a, a sort of a, a center which does enough cases that you, you keep your skills in because obviously if you do one case every couple of years you you're not going to build up on your skills so i do think um, that it is important to to for centers to build up their experience and I do think that we need to still improve our scanning and detection of these conditions uh, early, especially in multiple pregnancies. So I hope that all these delegates who are part of the ultrasound course, at least um, they, they you know, are aware of the problems that can happen in, in uh, twins, which are the conditions, the anomalies, which are amenable to treatment and uh, they, they learn scanning in that. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. I really wish I could have played that. I could have played that video. I'm so keen. They're doing such a great job, and I think all of us should be aware of it. You but can send all Dr. You can put the link in the chat box. Yeah. So you can people can, can I interrupt you? Sorry, Dr. Yeah. Fardosi is here. She is the chairperson for this session. So let her give her expert comment, Dr. Fardosi Begum. She was here a minute ago. So and we welcome Dr. Narendra Malhotra, sir. We can see him here. Hello, yeah. sir. Good evening. Yeah. So I think uh, Dr. Fardosi. I think she was very busy, but she did come in. And uh, yeah, you can go ahead, Dr. Amino. I'm sorry. Yeah. And welcome, Dr. Rina Vani. I'll let me just call her if she's here. So because she's the. Yeah. You you go on with your comment, Dr. Amino. Yes. Yes. So there are a few questions. Where... Uh, of course, there are many um, compliments. Then uh, Dr. Poonam Goel wants to know what fluid you use for procedures. We use ringers, our normal saline. Normal saline, okay. All right. What happens uh, if amniotic fluid in fetal intervention, is it reduced to such an extent that it has to be replaced? If so, then how do you replace it? Uh, no, we, we prefer having a sort of mild oligoamnios. That is better for us than to worry about, because as soon as the intervention causes the correction of the procedure, uh, the, the uh, physiology, then the fluid will form anyway. So we'd rather have less than, than put in more. So the only time that we actually put in more is to see. So once the procedure is over, you kind of drain off all the fluid and have like a deepest vertical pool of about six. So you drain off liters. Sometimes we drain off two and a half, three liters. But you push in a lot while the procedure is going on, just so that you can see. Okay. Thank Only you. one question I also want to ask: between radio yeah. frequency and laser, which one do you prefer, or is it you know different for different procedures? Yeah, it's different for different procedures because uh, the laser is you, you need, it's an external heat source and it's an external source where you need to, you, you need to visualize it and do surface burning. 
whereas radio frequency is inside the tissue. So if you have to access inside the tissue, you need to uh, use RFA. However, you also use laser, like you use lasers uh, as an interstitial because laser is very good. Actually, it's procedure to procedure based and it depends on access. I mean, the Medical point is you should have everything with you. So you decide what would be best for that case. Many compliments, very informative and excellent talk. Technology is mm -hmm. advancing beyond in imagination. Dr. Narendra Lothra sir said, great talk. Mm -hmm. So many compliments he's, he's to you. He's the technology <laughs> king. <laughs> if something new comes up, uh, Naren is the first one to. I know. Thank you, Kanika. It. it was a great, great presentation. I think we are all enlightened by your work and the videos you have presented. So I, I think we uh, shall we conclude this session. We're just waiting for the chairperson. She'll join in. She's out of the network, Dr. Fardosi. When she joins in, we'll. Uh, you know, uh, have her comment. So now uh, we go for the panel, Dr. Um, Ar Archana, I have joined. Oh, Dr. Hello. Fardosi is here. Dr. Fardosi is here. Yeah, yes. please, uh, Dr. Fardosi, uh, let me introduce her again. She is president of Safog and she's a great person, great human being. And she is right now president of um, Bangladesh uh, Society. And she was busy with Safe Motherhood program in her country. Over to you, Dr. Fardosi, for your expert comments. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I beg apology um, for two things. Number one, being uh, being delayed. Uh, there was an important program, I think it's a national program OGSB was doing for the Safe Motherhood Day, which is the Prime Minister's program in Bangladesh. So it was excellent. Um, it took time, number one. Number two is the interruption of the uh, uh, internet due to these years. So um, there is a notified interruption of the internet going on. So you cannot see my face, unfortunately. So <laughs> I, I, um, first of all, I missed the ultrasonogram uh, lecture, but um, I heard about heard from Anika. It, it's excellent, basically. And the, the comment, there's the technology going beyond imagination. That's true. Um, and I see the commitment of the doctor. She, she did her best to learn. And and um, she had learned things and doing it practically and um, benefiting immense um, um, in a lot uh, to the uh, sufferers because we know uh, when this program uh, problem comes, it's really, it's very heartening to the family uh, and especially to the mother because um, sometimes these are very valuable childs. So that is very important. And um, these are basically necessary. Uh, in, in Apex hospitals where the tertiary referral centers, where you have these modern technologies to help a lot many patients. They, they are not uh, much in number, maybe very big in India because India is a big, big country. But the thing is, it's a very low percentage of um, per, um, babies are affected in this way. But if we can help them, it's really help to the family, families and we see less tragedies. Because you know this um, um, spinal bifida, that's not very uncommon. We we often see, but and it's basically if we could help with these, uh, I think the damage of the nerves. These are quite very um, affectionate child, you know. So we lost them. So these these are the technologies which um, helps utmost. Uh, so that has to be. Um, carried on and I think it has to be uh, developed in uh, of, um, all the countries, especially in the all over the world. Or, and we can have bigger meetings to sensitize and uh, make it applicable to other countries and other centers as well. But I had a, a small uh, question that you were talking about laser. Uh, the plasma therapy is coming up. Is there any role of plasma therapy in fetal surgery? So that was my question, and um, um, I again thank the organizer and Dr. Archana. Archana said I am a great person, but I am giving the same compliment to Archana because we we are just committed person. We try to do what has been endowed to us, and from our heart, we've come up with things need, needed to do for the society and countries and for our patients. So I I again thank you you for inviting me and organizing this on behalf of the Fox session. This is great work. So I'll be happy if I can be answered. Though this, this may be a 
um, I think, novice question, but there is no question what is silly. Thank you so much. Which is true. Um, and, uh, thank you, uh, Professor, because I think, did we not meet each other in Dhaka some years back? Um, I think so, yeah. Because I think that, uh, I mean, everyone had hosted a really nice fetal medicine conference there. And I have to remember the chicken biryani. Yeah, yeah, I, I met you, Two yes. Two chicken biryani as, as well as the Bangladeshis, according to me. Um, I'm not aware, actually, of plasma therapy being used. We use plasma pharesis. So uh, a condition, is, so if, for instance, um, in, in rhesus isoimmunization, if, for instance, the antibodies are really sky high at 12, 12, 13 weeks. And even though you anticipate that it, you know, technically the baby becomes immunologically competent at 16 weeks. So we don't really expect that there would be problems before 16 weeks. Um, however, there, if, if by chance one is in that situation, then we have replaced the, the entire um, plasma so we've done a plasma phoresis and replaced it in a hope to taking away all the antibodies. Um, and and that, that's, that, that's the, the indication that I know in, in our field, um, but not so much as, as giving it. Thank you. I think that's being anyway, used thank for, you for the Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fardosi, for your encouraging comments. I think we should take forward uh, this, you know, ultrasound to all over uh, the world, but especially in the Suffolk countries, as Anita has said, that people know, but they don't know where exactly to go for, uh, you know, specialized procedures. So thank you, everyone. And I think we close the first session and uh, Dr. Arti, you may take over from here. And thank you for excellent talks. Now we move on to the second session, which is our panel discussion. Uh, I would like to invite our esteemed moderators for the session. First, we have Dr. Nino Agarwal. Ma'am requires no introduction. She's our post convener. We know her as the Foxy Imaging Science Committee chairperson, and she is the national director for the clinical board of Morpheus IVF. She has trained many students in India as well as internationally. And thank you so much for being here with us. We have Dr. Chinmay Omarji, so is one of the leading fetal medicine specialists in Pune, Maharashtra. He is the fetal medicine specialist at his own hospital, uh, which is the Omarji Mother and Child Hospital, as well as many other corporate hospitals in Pune. So thank you so much for being the moderator for our session. Now we, I would like to introduce our esteemed panel. Firstly, we have Professor Narendra Malhotra. Sir is uh, we all know, we don't really need to introduce him, but just for the sake of formality, we know him as the president of Foxy in 2008. He has taught many, many students all throughout the years. He has been the dean of ICMU and the director of the Iron Donor School of Ultrasound. So thank you and welcome. Across from Pakistan, we have Professor Rubina Sohail. Uh, Ma'am is the professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Services Institute of Medical Science in Lahore and Pakistan. Uh, she has been the immediate past president of the South Asian Federation of Obsgyni and has also served on the FIGO Committee on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. Ma'am, welcome. Thank you. I would like to invite Professor Lubna Hassan. She is the consultant uh, Obsgyni in Pakistan, in Peshawar. She is the vice president of SAPO and the founder of Women's Hospital. Ma'am, welcome. I would like to invite Rachna Basel, ma'am. Again, ma'am needs no introduction. She's our post convener, and we know her as the vice president of Foxy. Ma'am, a warm welcome to you. From Bhutan, I would like to invite Dr. Dorji. Uh, Dr. Dorji has been the editor in chief of Bhutan Health Journal and head of His Majesty's Tribune Medical Unit in Bhutan. He's also the founder chairperson for the Research Ethics Board of Health. So, welcome. Dr. Jeena Wani, uh, ma'am, has been the teacher for thousands and thousands of students having passed out from Mumbai. Uh, she, has, she is the head of department of Cooper's Hospital in Mumbai and has many, many awards 
in Berlin. Ma'am, welcome. And last but not the least, Dr. Mumtaz. Ma'am is Professor of Department of Obstetrics at the NES Medical College in Kerala and has again multiple, multiple awards under her name. Ma'am, extending a warm welcome to you and all our panelists. I would now like to hand over to Meenu Agarwal, ma'am, and Chinmay, sir, to take over the panel. <coughs> Um, yeah, hello everyone, uh, and very good evening to you. So this is a very nice and very different topic that uh, Dr. Uh, Ashna Basir has, you know, uh, decided for this particular panel. Um, huge credits to you for this, this uh, thought, and we will start the panel. So, um, Chinme, can you share your screen? You start with the first case. I will take the next case, and then you start with the third case. I'll take the fourth case. Sure, ma'am. Sure. So, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Arshana, uh, Ma'am, Safa, Vaison, Foxy uh, for this uh, very ingenious and excellent panel. Uh, and when we started thinking about technologies, uh, we were thinking that we need to have something which can be very low tech, low cost and applicable to almost the entire population. So, why don't we uh, kind of come down from the... Uh, ivory towers of fetal medicine and fetal procedures and let us come down to what we can do for everyone with simple technologies. So this is not so uh, uncommon a scenario, 29 years old, priming gravida, IVF pregnancy, otherwise low risk on antenatal care with a BMI of 24, uh, reports to the emergency with uh, 26 weeks pregnancy, convulgence, blood pressure 180, 110. Um, on examination, uterus is irritable and heart rate is not good. Uh, Dr. Mumtaz, uh, what's your diagnosis and uh, how do you want to proceed from here? Uh, with this patient coming with hypertension of 180 or 110 and convulsions, the diagnosis has to be eclampsia. And of course, you can't localize the fetal heart sound, so I doubt there is intraepitheline demise also. And with the uterus irritable, maybe there's abruption also. Abruption would have caused this intrauterine demise actually. Because in eclampsia, we don't see that much of intrauterine demise. Maybe there's also an abruption adding on to this fetal demise. That's, that's what my opinion is. Absolutely. So what, yeah. Okay, go ahead. go ahead. Okay. So what next would we do? Um, uh, Dr. Rubina Soher? Yeah. So the thing is that I would just like to take, take you back to the scenario. So in the scenario, when we are thinking about eclampsia, and as uh, my previous person said that we have to think about abruption, in the uh, findings it is written that the uterus is irritable, fetal heart sounds are not heard, but we have to look at the tone of the uterus in trying to find out whether there's any abruption which could accompany preeclampsia and eclampsia as well. So I think that is important. The second thing to look out for is the BMI of the patient. The BMI is 24, which means that she was probably not a high-risk patient for preeclampsia as such. Now, can we come to the next slide, please? Now, if we have diagnosed eclampsia, there are two things. The first thing is that we have to basically control her convulsion by magnesium sulfate and make sure that her blood pressure is brought down to normal, most often uh, by giving hypolysine intravenous infusion and to ensure that these two things are in control. Once these two things are in control, we have to deliver this patient. And delivery of the patient generally should be done by induction of labor unless there is a contraindication to vagina delivery. But as this patient, we saw this patient, this patient actually could deliver by vagina delivery and induction would be a good route. And this is the kind of patient whom we need to follow in terms of her blood pressure and in terms of her planning for the future pregnancy so that we can intervene before she gets pregnant again so that the same problems do not start in the next pregnancy. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rubina, for detailed uh, explanation. Uh, so can we now move on to Dr. Reena Vani, ma'am? And uh, ma'am, can you tell us how we could have prevented this? So, Chinmay, before we talk about uh, prevention, uh, let's, let's first of all, when you say she's low risk on antenatal care, I wouldn't agree with you with that. A primary gravida requiring IVF uh, coming yeah. with the PIH is not low risk by any standards. So she would be labeled as a red flag right from the beginning of antenatal care. And as Dr. Rubina very well pointed out, it's possible that the FHS may still be there, 
but uh, I missed, so you need to confirm and I would actually like to get an ultrasound gun. We have seen many such cases where there is a, a, a concealed abruption and which does not manifest. And although you were fortunate in this patient that she has delivered vaginally, I am very sorry to say we have had actually a couple of patients where we have tried our best uh, with the preterm tubular cervix. She does not deliver and you are forced to do a cesarean section because they land up with a cuvillary uterus. And I'm very uh, sad to say we actually lost one patient because she had been waited on for too long in periphery by the time she came to us thinking that it's a IUFD, it's a, uh, a primary, it's a PIH, we will try to deliver, deliver, deliver. But by the time she came to us, it was very late. And although we had to operate on her, do an OH, she she was actually, she went into renal failure and she was gone. So here we have to remember that we have to look at the given condition. One more important thing, in our country, IV hydralazine is not easily available. We are often using a combination of nifedipine and labetalol. Uh, and Maxalf, when you're giving it by uh, Pritchard regime, remember that both Maxalf and Nifedipine land up relaxing the uterus, which is why they sometimes have a flagging uterus and they go into EPH also. So these are all very important things in Eclamptex, which we have practically had problems with, which you have to be vigilant. Now that IV labetalol is available, it's very good. Obviously, nobody uses sublingual nifedipine, but when you're using nifedipine for BP control, especially in smaller settings where you don't have IV labetalol, you can give 20 uh, oral, it acts within a few minutes, but it will relax the uterus. So you have to you know, balance between what is available and what is going to work in this patient and then go ahead. So uh, having said that, then I can go to your primordial prevention because I said this is very Nina, important. Uh, yeah. can, I, can I just intervene over here because you have said something very important. And I think I would like to point out over here that the most important thing is that we have a clear diagnosis. If the diagnosis is eclampsia, the management would be a little bit different. But if we are managing a patient who has had with eclampsia and abruption, then the management will obviously change and we will have to modify according to the situation. Absolutely. And I Can couldn't... I just say one a second? Yes. Uh, as Rubina Madam and Rina Madam told, if there is abruption, which is big enough to kill the features, that means it is grade three abruption. The chances of developing DIC is also very high. So the certain section would be better. And in this situation, most of the time in ultrasound, we are not able to find any retroplacental clots. So clinical assessment would be very important. Also the fire, the serial assessment. Uh, so, Momtaz, as you rightly mentioned, sometimes one lands up doing cesarean. In fact, just yesterday on our call, we had a multi paris patient with this almost same clinical picture, 26 weaker. And my registrar said, Madam, she is multi paris, she will deliver. We actually tried with uh, 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 induction, it was IUFD, abruption, with the eclampsia. But finally, we landed up doing a section because she was deteriorating and did not respond despite the multi So uh, although we don't do zero hour section when we know it's an IUFD, uh, in the interest of the mother, sometimes you need to go ahead with the cesarean before she goes into a full-blown DIC or renal failure. Uh, Dr. Malhotra, uh, may I uh, ask for your help and could you kind of tell us right from say, uh, the basic secondary level settings to uh, quaternary level settings, are there any common protocols you would like to emphasize upon and tell everyone that these should be followed, say for myself, say for control of blood pressure, so on and so forth? So can I can I just because I, while you were talking, I just looked up my eclampsia drill presentation. Can I just share one slide? And can you go off and just put you there? So that is my that is our protocol that we in we teach that this box should be ready with every obstetric unit. Every obstetric unit should have a eclampsia management box. And this is the box which contains the magnesium therapy, the correct uh, number of them. And what does this have? This has all these things. So if you have to, whatever the smallest of hospitals, two bed hospital delivering only one baby a week, this eclampsia and PPH box is what the Iron Donald School uh, of Obstetrics uh, propagated. And now we are propagating it through Manita program. So including, see the small things, gloves, plastic airway, suction catheter, foley's, syringes, all the sizes, intracats, no pink intracat, please, no pink intracat to be, blood pressure, IV, magnesium sulfate, 14 ampules of 50 by volume by weight. And that is how you will dilate. 
in, um, normal saline because of hydrolysine, as I just heard, we have lobotolol, which will work for 20 minutes, calcium gluconate, hydrocortisone, Ryle's tube, laryngoscope, tornike, Eurobag, ab absolutely everything ready for in your uh, uh, labor room setup to manage the, an eclampsia whenever it comes. And uh, your eclampsia drill, what we call as a firefighting drill, your staff, your staff, your junior most nurse, your senior most nurse, every at least once a month should go through a mock drill of PPH and a mock drill of eclampsia. So absolutely they're ready. The minute your call goes, comes to you, the magnesium sulfate is given, the catheterization is done, IV line is set up, levotrol is given, everything is done by, by a well-trained, well-oiled team. So that is would be my major point of prevention, secondary tertiary. Of course, we have technology, but let's go to the basics of what basics should be ready. And this is the very accessible low-cost low tech, I think, which every hospital should uh, has access to and should employ, isn't it? So, uh, moving on to our fetal medicine uh, expert, Dr. Uh, Dorji. So, would you like to talk about prevention now? So, how can we help this lady in the future pregnancy and how could we have, could we have helped in the past pregnancy? Mm, uh, greetings from Bhutan. Uh, now, uh, this lady, I think uh, uh, for her next pregnancy, the best thing we could do is we should invite her to the pre-pregnancy council session and uh, work up with her hypertension, whether it is there or it is gone. And then uh, I think uh, it's an IBF pregnancy. So now uh, it's very difficult whether she will conceive uh, spontaneously or through IBF. So the, uh, what we can, uh, as a fetal medicine, we can help is after she is conceived, then we can follow her up. And beyond 12 weeks, I think the only option we have at hand is to offer her with the uh, low dose aspirin, 150 milligram. And uh, if she is, uh, we may add, or if there is a calcium supplementation with uh, so that is the uh, to prevent the hypertension with prayers that, and then follow her up with the Doppler studies, uh, and then intervene wherever necessary with the changes in the blood flow. So that is what all we can have, and then follow her up till delivery uh, with the Doppler plus growth scans, very close monitoring. So okay. it is uh, some reduction is there, but not hundred percent preventable. Absolutely. Dr. Archana, would you like to add something to this? I think everything has been uh, really dealt very well with, but as Dr. Doraji has said and Dr. Chinmay has and asked what we could do, I think prevention, like in the pre, uh, in the future counseling, and maybe she could be brought in first trimester to do the uterine artery dopplers and uh, we can um, start her on e um, eco spring earlier on before 16 weeks of pregnancy so that we can really reduce, though we cannot totally avoid, but reduce her chances of having severe preeclampsia in the next pregnancy. Any role of PSD? I, I, would, like to, I would like to counter uh, ask, should we, put, uh, should we put these patients on pre-pregnancy aspirin? How many of you think that we should give them three months before folic acid, aspirin, uh, and uh, multivitamin, antioxidants, and um, things like that. And of course, uh, meditation and relaxation, etc. So pre-pregnancy pre aspirin, and how much? Uh, there, are, there, are, there are some evidences that uh, people do recommend pre-pregnancy uh, aspirin, uh, and, and there's definitely folic acid uh, three months prior to that. Uh, but then it is not well established and accepted by everybody at present. Dr. Rajna, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that there are two things. One is uh, prediction and one is prevention. There, there are screening tools. Yes, this particular woman uh, does have a high risk factor in her history. Uh, uh, but uh, in the future, obviously, uh, history... Uh, would play an important part, but uh, history alone cannot predict whether she will have a clemsia again and what are her chances of having it. 
So that is one thing that, uh, uh, you know, now a lot of work has been done on that you do a combination of all the maternal risk factors uh, with the mean arterial uh, uh, pressures, the uterine artery pulse, fertility, and they've been a lot of work. And, and in fact, kits have been made and nice and everybody else is using them. And this would predict uh, sort of not, uh, not every case, but it would lead towards being better prepared where a particular woman who who's high risk is going to go on to uh, eclampsia and whether uh, preeclampsia uh, and uh, how bad it's going to be. And then you uh, can go on to prevention once. So basically you have screening from 11 to 14 weeks history plus, you know, whatever test is available. And then the low dose aspirin should start by about 12 weeks to 36 weeks. That is the recommendation. And also supplementation of calcium. Uh, which uh, has been proven to help. Uh, not the other things, but especially in our population where we are calcium deficient, many of us, uh, uh, calcium would, and if we talk about uh, sort of the prevention of eclampsia, uh, then following the patient up, giving magnesium sulfate, uh, you know, uh, if she, uh, uh, around 32 weeks uh, for, uh, to protect uh, the baby neurologically, if she is high risk for eclampsia, so that would be a good preventive uh, thing to uh, give. And of course, as uh, Narendra and everybody else said, um, antenatal care, of course, is the, the gold standard for prevention to pick, pick it up early. Minu, can I just add two important points? Okay. Uh, Dr. Narendra has thrown the cat amongst the pigeons, but I don't agree with him about uh, giving preconceptional uh, uh, low-dose aspirin. I don't think that's a message we can give our audience right now. It is only in experimental settings. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, she was an IVF conception. Often you will have the IVF specialist starting aspirin to uh, around the time of the embryo transfer. Those are the situations where we may consider, but definitely not preconception. That is the first point. Second thing is that everyone has now shifted to doing 11 to 13 weeks nuchal translucency scan, uh, which and uh, uh, screening is being done. Even although I'm at a public hospital, we offer it to our patients who are ready to get it done. At that time, getting the uterine artery Doppler and picking up uh, the patients at risk is important. And the last thing is the gestosis group in along with Foxy has come out with a gestosis score, which can be done, which includes clinical features, which will help you to categorize the patient when she has come in pregnancy to know if she is at high risk. So that may be one way of going forward. And there is one marker called S split one, which is believed to predict which are the patients who are more likely to get DIC, HELP syndrome, or other more severe complications. But this is still not available on a mass scale and can, is only being done in research settings. Rina Madam, Rina Madam is yeah. point. As yes. uh, Rina Madam told, we are all doing the NT scan at 11 to 13 weeks, and it is a golden opportunity to do the uterine artery doctor also. But nowadays, there is a, many of the people are doing double marker also, PAPA and serum free beta HCG. So if you are just adding PLG along with that, that is going to cost another extra 400 rupees. That is another screening method, which will give, which will pick more, more patients who are at risk for developing, mainly preterm preeclampsia. So you can do PLGF, you can do you can take the the arterial line. pressure, you turn artery Doppler, put it on the FMF, and you FMF. will get the result. Yes. Yes. And if it is more than one in hundred. Yeah, there, is, there is a there is a there is a commercial package available called as Penta Marker, where you do all these together, in, including the MAP, and get a, get a risk uh, for PIH at 13 weeks. So a 13 week scan is very important. And all 13 week scans should have a uterine artery Doppler. And then you can counsel them whether they want only a dual marker, or they want a complete screen uh, in which we can screen the PIH, where PIH, PLGF, MAP, all added on that platform, and you calculate a complete risk uh, which this patient would have. And that is very, very satisfying and very, very rewarding. Yeah, so it's very important uh, for all the delegates who are listening that to, to uh, put the patients on high risk for PIH is more important at the time of NT scan because aneuploidy is not as uh, common as compared to PIH. So we lose more lives due to PIH. Aneuploidies, so aneuploidies are one in thousand. PIH yeah. is 15%, 15 in 100. 
Absolutely, I totally agree with you. Yes, yeah. Chinmay, can we go to the next slide? Uh -huh. That is what was done. So PLGF was done, uterine artery PIs were done, PAPE was done, and her risks were like this. And uh, just to borrow Dr. Uh, Malhotra's question here, uh, Professor Doji, what dose would you prefer, 75 or 150? Uh, it is 150. Yes, 150 OD, once a day. Yes. And at bedtime. Yes. At bedtime. Would any of the other professors like to kind of comment? So uh, the ASPRE uh, trial was the one which actually changed the dose from 75 to 150. And actually some of the studies have given an in-between dose of 87.5, which is not available commercially. Some studies suggested giving it after lunch probably has a better effect. But all these are basically, you know, uh, in different settings. But the bottom line is 150 is better and it should be given after a meal whenever she's going to take it regularly and remember to take it. I think that is the message. The only indication to take a aspirin less than 100 milligram will be if a woman has a weight of less than 45 kg. In those women, we can give less than 100 milligram of aspirin. Very good point. So listening to listening to Prof Kipros Nicolaides in a very lighter mode when he was talking about aspirin, he said 150 milligram at bedtime because then women cannot complain of headaches in the night. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Chinmay. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lubna, uh, could you just tell us more about aspirin? So 5% of these patients would end up in having spotting. Some of them may already have ulcers. Would you like to kind of change anything about them? Uh, well, you see, that is one of the, the, uh, the, the precautions you have to take because it is a side effect. Uh, so, uh, you know, you give it, uh, you can give it in a lower dose, you give it at night after a meal, as uh, uh, one of the panelists said, uh, you can give it for a shorter time and not, uh, uh, otherwise it is recommended, you can give it up to 36 uh, weeks, but by 34 weeks, if, uh, you know, the baby is viable and uh, you can actually take her off the aspirin. Uh, so these are some of the things that I can think of. Uh, that uh, uh, can be done. And of course, if she does have a GI issue, then you just need to take her off. Perfect. Welcome, Dr. Shyam Desai, sir. I can see him. Uh, I think he joined a little late or he's again left, I think. Okay, never mind. Yes, Chin, we can go to the next slide. Huh? And, uh, so aspirin worked this time with this lady and uh, baby was initially on the higher side of the centiles, then slowly and steadily started developing fetal growth restriction at around this time it had it was kind of coming down it has now quas, uh, crossed 50 centiles and then we started monitoring this baby more closely um, so by this time patient had again developed her mild hypertension with proteinuria so she had now preeclampsia uh, serial growth scans were suggestive of growth restriction with normal doctors so uh, professor dorji when would you like to deliver this lady now I think we can closely follow her up and uh, our target. If if things remain under control and with the with the serial scans, if some fetal growth noted, uh, mm -hmm. then we can uh, go to thirty seven target would be. But if there is no fetal growth interval noted on two subsequent scans, then we need to we can deliver at any time. Any role of betisol in these cases? Uh, if she doctor, is going to be... Yes, huh, or Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Lubda, you can please answer, no problem. Yeah, I said if she's going to be, if you anticipate that she will be delivered before 34 weeks, mm -hmm. uh, then she should be given uh, both uh, uh, Maxalf and uh, steroids. Uh, because once she started showing, is this the same patient in her next pregnancy, I'm presuming? Right. 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 So, I mean, if she's showing signs of growth restriction and the mild hypertension, I don't know how mild is being defined here, but if it's 140 by 90, I mean, she is showing that there is progress in the disease. So it would be futile to wait beyond 37 weeks. Uh, and if it gets worse, 
you know, even before 37, I think she has to be monitored very, very carefully uh, and closely, uh, but preferably be taken to 37 weeks. But if the need arises, either for fetal or maternal reasons, she may need to be delivered even before that. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, sorry. I yes. would like to make uh, one uh -huh. clarification. Uh, right. Dr. Lubna mentioned something about MagSelf. MagSelf for neuroprotection is only to be given if you are expecting her to be delivered in the next 24 hours. Yeah. There is no right. role of giving it prophylactically at any point. If she has gone, in, and definitely you can give steroids for lung maturity in advance if you feel that you are going to need to deliver her or she's going towards help or any for other. The delegates, how but much, how much is only give? to be given if she has gone into labor and you think there's going to be a preterm delivery for neuroprotection. At that point, it will have a double benefit for PIH and for uh, yeah. the... So for the delegates, how much steroid will you give and how much Maxel will you give and when will you give? So let us just get cleared on this. Can I just topic. clarify the Maxel issue? If you are anticipating the patient to deliver the patient before 32 weeks, within the next few days, then you give one loading dose of Maxel. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and otherwise it wouldn't be needed. When and, you say loading uh, dose, how much do you give? Four to five grams. Four okay. grams. For neuro some give five, but you can give it IV. You can give it, but but I mean just the single dose. Okay. Uh, only if you're anticipating that uh, the delivery will take place before thirty-two weeks within the next few days. So that's just for neuroprotection, just the single dose, not to treat the eclampsia or okay. Can I add something? For uh, neuroprotection, the dose we give is four gram. Mm -hmm. uh, IV bolus followed by one gram per hour infusion for 24 hours. Absolutely. Yes, I agree with you. Yes. 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 Delivery does not occur, discontinue after 24 hours. Yeah. And yes. uh, that is it. So don't don't continue one. That's that's the right dose. And we, we just had a uh, FIGO consensus meeting. I was a member there where MagSelf is it's, it's all printed. You can go to Google and FIGO MagSelf uh, uh, group. Uh, we we Preterm labor for protection, neuroprotection. Uh, that's it. And then, you, then you don't repeat it. If one week later she has a problem again, then maybe again uh, it is. Otherwise, if she crosses 34 weeks, then you don't bother. Doctor Rubina wanted to say yeah. something. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight one point, and that point was that this time she has got mild hypertension or mild preeclampsia. So we do not need to go overboard. One thing that we need to keep in mind is that. Regular monitoring for this patient is very important in terms of history examination, biophysical profile, and also the Doppler studies in terms of umbilical artery Doppler and middle cerebral artery Doppler. If the Doppler continues to be normal, despite the fact that there is IUGR, I would not be very keen to deliver her at 37 weeks. Probably I'd like to go by 38 weeks and then induce. If there is a problem in between that the fetus has stopped gaining weight or the liquor is decreased or there are changes in the Doppler, then I think we need to hurry. That is number one. Number two, as a precaution, because this patient previously had eclampsia and this time she might steadily start fluctuating her blood pressure, I would give her steroid beta methasone as soon as I decide around 30, around 30, 32 weeks of pregnancy. I will give it because if at any point in time I need to deliver her, methasone has already been given. The third thing is, that magnesium sulfate should be given only if you're planning to deliver the baby, that too before 34 weeks. And I agree with Narendra when he says that after you have given the loading dose of four grams, then you give a maintenance dose for 24 hours and then that's it, we don't have to repeat. I think we should move a little fast, Chinmay, for the next case. And uh, these are the really take home messages that preterm preeclampsia is predictable. On the right side of the screen, you see uh, the simple questionnaire designed by NICE. Uh, add to that uh, mean arterial pressure and you have got something much better. So this is no cost model and gestosis score of FOXY uh, really focuses on this. So let us adopt that in our simple day-to-day -day practice. Uh, history, BMI, SMAP, uterine atrepia, SPAPA, PHF, you'll have the best detection rate uh, with 95% of pre, uh, pre eclampsia being detected. Also, they can be prevented with good compliance of aspirin. So, mind you, if the compliance is better than 90%, almost 95% of pre you can prevent like we did in this case. If compliance is anywhere less than 90%, 
the prevention is only 55%. So bombard on your patients that they need not, I mean, they should not miss the tablet ever. So that is important. And uh, with that, we part with our first case. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, can you stop share? While ma'am shares it, uh, one point probably we would like to drive home again is that for most of the preeclampsias, deliver them at 37 weeks. There is a lot of evidence out there. Uh, prolonging pregnancy beyond 37 really does not help. So, All right. So our second case, I will take it very fast now from here. Uh, she's a 29-year-old, uh, 9.3 weeks, ICSI conceived for male factor infertility. You we are not seeing any slides. It's a blank screen. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, but I can see my slide. Okay, all right. Okay, can you see it now? No, ma'am. We can't see your screen, we know. Share the screen. Okay, I'll share it again. One moment. Uh, I'm stop sharing and I will share it again. Uh, okay. Okay. Can we see it now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm so sorry mm -hmm. for this. Uh, so she's a 29 years old lady, 9.3 weeks, ICSI conceived for male factor infertility. She has a history of laparoscopic myomectomy done four months ago for fundal and posterior myoma, six centimeters indenting into the endometrium. Uh, she was referred back to her primary gynecologist after positive HCG and cardiac activity was seen. She came back at 9.3 weeks with missed abortion. So this, she came back with this ultrasound, uh, no cardiac activity, and we uh, took her in the OT for a DNA. We did the DNA, but there were no products of conception. What next? Uh, anybody can answer. Yeah, Dr. Meenu, I think, uh, you know, when you don't find any product of conception, I mean, uh, the women who had missed abortion uh, and conceived IVF ICSI, I am the person who is an ultrasound person. I don't do any of my uh, DNA without ultrasound guidance. I'm sure you must have done it in USG guidance. So you would have seen where your uh, suction cannula is going or was there anything more uh, which we are missing in ultrasound, whether it was an intrauterine pregnancy at first place. Right. So we did the ultrasound. You're right. We did the ultrasound in the OT because we didn't find any products. We could see the GSAC, uh, but there were no products. And we when we were doing the DNA, the, you know, it, it appeared as if the cavity is empty and we are not reaching the sac. So if we have everything in the OT, what next can we do at this point of time? Uh, Dr. Malhotra, sir, you can answer. Anybody can answer. Is it a hypomid uterus, ma'am? Or coronal pregnancy? Abdominal pregnancy, maybe. So it could be coronal. It could be intramural. It could be a bicornuate horn. Uh, it, so your, I would guide the uh, dilator slowly under ultrasound to see if it is going here or not. And if it is not, I would even try to do it hysteroscopically. So I agree with you. I totally agree with you. We did try um, uh, under ultrasound guidance and then we did a hysteroscopy for her and this is what we found. The hysteroscopic cavity was absolutely empty. There is nothing, no sac seen. Um, and uh, But we could see the sac on ultrasound. Could it so, be um, biometric? Uh, one, in, one in a million case. One in a million case. <laughs> and it was inside the fibroid, the pregnancy. <laughs> was it a scar it's pregnancy? It's probably it's a scar ectopic. It's a scar pregnancy. It's a scar yeah. ectopic. Yeah. Yeah. So then we sent her for an ultrasound. It spoke Plus to the Doppler. Retina. Yeah, sent her for an ultrasound with color Doppler. Now you can see here a triple line endometrium over here. Uh, and you can see a pregnancy surrounded on all the sides by a myo by a myometrium. Hmm. What next now? Well, I think you have to put in the OG. Sorry. Beta HCG. 
beta hcg we did not do at this point of time i no, mean no, why do you need beta hcg it's a missed abortion so i would i would still go hysteroscopically now i know where it is and i'll try to cut this area okay. and be, oh. be, be a little heroic and try to evacuate it hysteroscopically so i will try that first before putting a laparoscope or opening her up so okay. i'm going to try and see that this is very clear i'll have an ultrasound in the ot so someone guiding me there with the hysteroscope i would go like this and try to cut make a small cut here so maybe so, maybe i would reach maybe i will not uh, it will depend on that right i have a different opinion sir people <laughs> doctor clearly that's how different we are no <laughs> So, uh, clearly, clearly, it is away from the endometrial cavity. It looks like a, a more advanced or a grade three uh, scar ectopic, which is surrounded all around by the myometrium. So, I would either go for a uh, methotrexate or a surgical evacuation under laparoscopic guidance. All right. So, this uh, particular patient, yes, Doctor Vani. Yes. I Kira. agree with what Mumta says. The ultrasound picture showed a very thick area between the uterine cavity. Uh, sir is an expert at ultrasound and other things, but I would say that uh, one should be very wary in these cases, and there is a lot of evidence. You can try either surgically administered uh, medical treatment with your ultrasound guidance. You can inject into that sac also, rather than systemic methotrexate. That is one option. Another thing is, if at all you want to do anything heroically, hysteroscopically, I would definitely have a laparoscope in place when you're doing something. Absolutely, and there's, absolutely. There's and no there's lots of evidence, that. sir, which have shown that in these scar ectopics, whether it is in a myomectomy scar or whether it's a cesarean scar, laparoscopic evacuation and secure suturing will be better if she's wanting to have another pregnancy. We had a case series of three cases in which we did find that there was one patient who actually had a problem with a future rupture because it had been managed medically and other things. And then this, uh, that uh, it, we were not sure what to do with her in the next pregnancy. It was a problem. So, can you see the video in the here? I'm showing sure no, the no. video. We can't see the video. Oh, we no, are no, only no. seeing the slide we, now. We can also can put see. a very thick or you have to make it full screen, then only the video will come. Okay, all right. Now, can you see the video? No. No, we know we can't see your video. Oh my god! I can see it on my screen, so I sh it should be seen, right? Uh, okay. Mm. We can even put a ultrasound guided 16, 17 gauge needle and try to aspirate it. Can you and see the video now? No, 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 Minu. I think maybe you can just describe it because we are okay. running very. All right. I, I understand. Okay. So if we can't see the video, because I'll share the video with because we presented this particular in Figo. This case was published, and um, what we did was we uh, the husband, the relative of the patient was a doctor. So we we there was this was the first case of laparoscopic management of a myometrial scar ectopic. And we injected a uh, pitrisin, vasopressin, diluted one in hundred, uh, and then we took a post-spring suture. We managed it like a coronal pregnancy, and then gave a nick and removed the products of conception. See, even if we manage it, medical management is possible. What Dr. Inawani said. Only thing is, even if we give the medical management, there is always still a possibility of the rupture of the uterus because the you know the um, the placent the chorionic tissue keep on uh, make. Uh, keep on growing. So uh, I have a wonderful video, but I I don't know why it is not been seen. So uh, then you can send a link to us. And, okay, all right. And the only few things I would just like to say that use of vasopressin in these cases, use of posturing suture in these cases, and then um, uh, a good suturing you can use a V-lock suture. I think I can see all the laparoscopic surgeon Dr. Shamdesai sir is there. Uh, and uh, this particular patient has already conceived and delivered twins at term 38 weeks. So it's a good strong scar. And I think a laparoscopic management is a good option in these cases. Uh, Congratulations, Dr. Meenu, for successfully managing this case. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so we, um, okay, so we can go for the next case, um, Chinmay, and then we will go for my next case quickly. Sure. Uh, hmm. So we'll move on now to the next case and again this is a very common scenario on the labor rooms uh, let me so let me at the outset thank uh, various people dr vandana khanejo has shared uh, those two cases with me and 
So her team at Jahangir Hospital have managed those. Dr. Chanchal and Team Apollo have shared uh, a few images with me. So I'm thankful to all of them. Uh, so in this case, 34 years old, uh, second pregnancy, previous cesarean, posterior placenta previa. Uh, throughout the pregnancy, it was documented that it is a low-lying placenta. Um, on the last scan, it said that it was covering the horse. She was admitted at 35 plus 4 with uh, painless PV bleeding. Um, Antenal steroids were, were given for fetal lung maturity and bleeding controlled with tranexamic acid. So now bleeding has stopped. Uh, just to complete uh, the previous discussion, uh, we are saying betamethasone, dexamethasone. So uh, we have got uh, good studies out of our country from uh, PJ and AIMS. And they say that international market has betamethasone acetate and phosphate. India at least has betamethasone sodium phosphate. So let us check what Bangladesh and Pakistan have. Uh, if they are also having the same compound with the same brand name. So betnesol internationally is available as this compound. In India, it is available as this compound. So if you have access to acetate plus phosphate, always use betamethasone because it has lung plus brain protection. But if you do not have access to acetate plus phosphate, always go with DEXA, which is superior to betamethasone sodium phosphate. Uh, so steroids were given. Uh, now patient is not bleeding, heartbeat is okay. We are waiting for steroid action to come, continuous monitoring on the labor ward uh, and high risk uh, consent was taken, bloods were sent. Uh, Dr. Mumdas, would you like to do anything else for this lady? Uh, she is only 34 weeks, right, Chinmay? Five plus four, yeah. And her bleeding was bleeding also was self-limiting. Why are you trying to deliver this? Almost 36 weeks. It's written 38 weeks here. Oh, 30, no, no. 34 no, no. years old. 35 plus 4. 38, ah, 35 plus 4. She's only 36. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so uh, at this point, because she's a previous sister in section and she's having a uh, placenta previa, uh, mm -hmm. I, would, I would like to rule out uh, whether there is any morbidly adherent placenta in this patient. With a posterior placenta, ma'am? Yes, we have seen cases like that with posterior placenta also. There is morbidly adherent placenta. It need not be due to the cesarean scar itself. Even previous previous normal deliveries and previous DNCs, we have seen such cases with posterior placenta previa. Perfect. And that is what happened here. So there was evidence of morbidly adherent placenta after delivery of the baby. The placenta wouldn't come out. It was removed piecemeal. Uh, there was excessive bleeding. Figure of eight sutures were taken uh, on the placental bed. Uh, uterine artery ligation was done, followed by two sutures to control bleeding. However, bleeding still continued. Now patient is uh, collapsing. Blood pressure has uh, come down. Lines were put in. Uh, patient was given GA. Uh, as you would all agree that uh, compared to spinal, you can get a better control under GA. And a massive blood transfusion was started. Uh, Professor Rubina, would you like to do something? Over here. I, I would like to just comment about a couple of things. The yeah. first thing is that if there is previous one cesarean section and it is placenta previa, the chances of an abnormally adherent placenta is only 3%. So if a patient with previous one cesarean section comes to us, there generally should be something in the ultrasound to make us think of abnormally adherent placenta. And then if it is so, we should go for MRI in cases of posterior placenta previa. If the cesarean section are more than one, so with two cesarean section, the possibility of abnormally adherent placenta is 11%, with three it is 40%, with four it is 60, and so on and so forth. So the point that I'm trying to make is that the number of the more the number of cesarean sections, and if they are presenting with placenta previa, the more vigilant we need to be for the cases of abnormally adherent placenta. Because for abnormally adherent placenta, the best results will come if we are prepared and if we are anticipating that it is going to be placenta, acrylita, et cetera. Because if we do not anticipate, most of the time we do not have enough blood available, the kind of anesthesia services that we need, the monitoring for blood loss, and the team that we need for management of this patient most of the time would be missing. So in an ideal situation, if we can evaluate these patients carefully in the antenatal period, that is the best thing to do to make a plan for delivery. In this particular situation, because it was previous one cesarean section and it was thought that it was simple placenta previa with, I don't think that there was any 
evidence of morbidly adherent placenta prior to surgery. So they just found out that there was, was a locate, localized low uterine segment adherence posteriorly and interiorly, which was removed in a piecemeal manner. So what I would think was that maybe we could have taken out a chunk of the wall of the uterus and done a resuturing because if we are just going to remove the morbidly adherent placenta from here and leave it like that, there's greater probability that next time this will become a focus for the placenta to become adherent again. So this is one thing that I would like to do. Then monitoring of the amount of blood loss and making sure that the amount of blood loss is repaired. Now, regarding the decision of uh, obstetrical hysterectomy, I think that this is uh, something which is a choice of the surgeon at that point. So if there is only focal adherence of the placenta, then it is not necessary to go for cesarean hysterectomy. But if, uh, and if, especially if you think that you can remove that focus and resuture the uterus, then obstetrical hysterectomy is not indicated. But if that does not help, then obviously one has to go for detailed counseling and consent for obstetrical hysterectomy. Remember, it is only two babies. And in our South Asian countries, a hysterectomy at two is not taken very lightly. One thing is that often uh, people keep struggling until the patient is almost collapsed I agree. before they take the yeah, decision. Totally, totally. Whatever decision needs to be done has to be done with a time frame in mind. Yes. Uh, do not wait till the patient's uh, pulse is 140 and the BP has gone to 60. Another thing is piecemeal removal may not be a very good idea. There mm -hmm. is a suggestion also that if you feel it's a morbidly adherent placenta, before you start trying to remove it, do the uterine artery ligation before that, or consider in these situations an internal iliac artery ligation. And in fact, we have in our own institute started training all our registrars and lecturers in routine elective cesarean section and make them open the peritoneum, identify the internal iliac. Because what happens is in dire situation when patient has collapsed, then there is utter chaos. And I'm happy to say this has helped at least few women to be saved because your team is trained to be able to do a quick decision and do a quick internal iliac ligation. It may save the uterus, particularly in placenta previa. In an obstetric hysterectomy, especially yeah. now patient has been in labor for some time and then you are doing it, it is very difficult to get the complete cervix. And if you leave a rim behind, your obstetric hysterectomy also will not save the patient. You will require to do it along with internal iliac ligation. So mm -hmm. first do the internal iliac ligation, it may save the patient and save the uterus. Thanks, Serena. That's a very good take home point. I mean, as a teacher, that you are training your students to do an internal artery ligation at the time of C-section, at least teaching them how to do it. They're not ligating every case. Not ligating, but teaching them how to do it. Ask the suture and right. so that they are confident. They are confident. Excellent. Yes, I'd, like, I'd like to add to just two things. Uh, in ultrasound, it is very difficult to diagnose morbidly adherent placenta if it is posterior. That is one thing. And what... In practical, we will not suspect a morbidly adherent placenta that to posterior in a single uh, previous cesarean case. So what has happened has happened in uh, what would have happened anywhere. Piecemeal removal is the natural thing to happen. But as Rina Madam told, in internal iliac ligation could have been made a difference in this case, especially when we have to preserve the uterus. And as Rina Madam told, we are also training. I'm very happy to share that. We are actually making them do. We are actually making them do the, the final year PGs. And I've actually presented that paper also in Ahmedabad once. Yes. yes. Chinmay, we can go for the next slide. Can right? I just add a, a, Lugna, yeah, a yeah. single sentence? Sure. Um, I, I just want to add that in the in uh, this thing of uh, retained placenta, I mean, that's what we're talking about, that the placenta did not come out. Uh, or if, uh, you know, if there is not too much bleeding to begin with, it's much better to leave it then to try and pull it out piecemeal. Most of the damage is done piecemeal. If it's at the time of a cesarean, it is at the time of a cesarean, then it is the minute you realize, or if you already know that it may be a creta or some spectrum of PAS, it is much better to deliver the baby and leave the placenta in cyto if you see that it has gone out or there is bleeding and to just focus on stopping the bleeding. First, it's, there is no harm in even going for a second laparotomy or taking the uterus out, whatever then at that moment is, uh, you know, the condition of the patient dictates. But the first thing is not to let that woman bleed. 
like the hysterectomy, if it's going to be done, has to be performed not too early or too late. And that requires a, a senior judgment. So normally, if a senior person is there, uh, you know, that is the crucial thing where we lose patients. Uh, Chinmay, can I just add, Dr. Professor Arul Kumaran had presented something called as a triple P procedure, yeah. which yeah. is something which uh, is very important for all of us to know, which may actually be a good way forward. So if you want to, uh, you know, uh, that is something which uh, I don't think we have time, we're running late, but that is something we should be aware of, in which what Dr. Lubna has said, that uh, you don't uh, uh, try to remove, or as Dr. Rubina mentioned, you shave off part of the myometrium along with the adherent placenta and then Thank you, professors, for your valuable inputs. Moving on to the second part of the same case. So, uh, same concern, another six months' time, received another idea. This time it was empty. And so she was weeks. Again, she had painless PV bleeding. Her antenatal scans were not up to the mark. So another scan was done. And uh, Professor Dorji, would you like to comment on the images? Or NM, sir? And see. Professor Dorji, are you with us? Yes, yes. Yes, sir, please. please. I think there is a loss of uh, placental uh, myometrial and placental, that thin, fine ecolution area is not well seen. And there is breakage everywhere. So irregular retroplacental sonal lucent there. Yes, sir. Um, and then, sir, so this is accreta, or maybe percreta also, because it seems to be going out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So you see clearly, you can see here. Yes, sir. Mm. Yeah, and see, it's going into the uterine serosal bladder as this 3D color mm. uh, flow vascularization shows. And this is how valuable the Doppler is. So 3D power Doppler is an essential tool in your ultrasound kitty. Always make sure that you buy one. And uh, to complete the picture, another MRI was also uh, ordered. Uh, patient was still stable. And uh, it showed that there was a small increta uh, which was going in. I'm sorry if this is coming in between. Yeah, focal placenta increta was there. Um, on the lower side. So uh, here you can clearly see that. Um... Yeah. Yes, sir, please go ahead if you want to describe the image. So you can see the aging of myometrium and uh, bladder interface is uh, getting eroded there, uh, much clearer in T2 weighted images. And uh, because there are Interplacental dark bands over here, as you can see. Um, uh, the diagnosis was much clearer now with MRI, uh, as uh, Professor Mumtaz had mentioned some time ago. So, um, between MRI and ultrasound, uh, the accuracy wise, the larger trials say there is no, not much of a difference. But uh, because ultrasound is much more handier tool, probably the quality control on ultrasound may not be at par. So uh, with best of the centers, probably will ha uh, have better quality control uh, and accuracy with 3D Dopplers. But all in all, MRI will give you clearer images. Am I right in that, uh, Malhotra, sir? Yeah. yeah, you are right, uh, Chinmay. Um, MRI can give a really better picture. But if you have done a like, you know, good sonography with the color Doppler and like, what the pictures Dr. Sonal was showing in her uh, uh, talk. So if you have high resolution and HD, like you can pick up uh, even placenta uh, accreta by a good ultrasound because MRI may not be accessible to everyone. Uh, Archana, uh, even without placenta accreta, uh, any pro tips about how to evaluate a placenta on ultrasound? So that we are used to, you know, looking at the interface and uh, making the diagnosis easy. Say, uh, say it again, Dr. Chinmay. You just want like how really to evaluate the. Precisely, ma'am. Precisely, ma'am. How, how one should develop a habit of evaluating placenta? 
I think I think it should be a routine practice. I mean, there's nothing like more specific thing you need because placenta, baby, and the liquor. These are the three very important things which you have to evaluate on every scan. So placenta, like when when we teach to our student, whether it is like what is the position of the placenta, you know, like the shape of the placenta, whether it is like a smooth pancake like or. uh you know the placenta has legs and all and plus just put the color and you see that the if the vessels are transgressing or they are parallel to the between the um, placenta and the myometrium so these are the small tips which one can uh, see and if it is specially a posterior placenta at times it can be tricky to pick up on ultrasound as well Uh, so uh, archana what i would like to say is that although you said mri may not be accessible to everyone what i would like to say is that good quality ultrasound as you may very nicely put it there's a lot of subjectivity involved in that and uh, we, it is very difficult i have myself despite being in a metropolitan city at a tertiary institute had a couple of cases where the ultrasound has been missed so if you are getting ultrasound as the only investigation make sure it is done by a qualified senior who is willing to take that responsibility that there is no previa and still be prepared for surprise on the table and mri is definitely something which you can use to document but you can't possibly send each and every patient for mri with previous lscs because now previous lscs has also become almost like an epidemic so in the selected cases you will have to use it yes till maybe we should go a little faster we are running very little faster yes now now to this so no. now we have a diagnosis of increta uh, uh, malotra sir how would you like to manage her uh, any fancy technologies where you can Uh, help. The fancy technologies are available um, uh, if you are in a big setup or a tertiary care setup, and of course you can put in the uh, put in the cannulas uh, in the internal alley, and uh, just as you deliver the baby, you can inject uh, polyvinyl particles through that and block the internal alley. So we can do uh, uh, do that uh, via the femoral route. Of course, the balloons can be put. and the balloon inflated and then you complete the surgery uh, after it and then just deflate the balloon see if there is bleeding if it if there is no bleeding it will be fine if there is bleeding then you got to put the polyvinyl particles and block the internal ileum so that's that's how that's a fancy tool but then this might not be available everywhere so you have to do this in the cath lab bring the patient back to the ot and then operate or you operate uh, convert your cath lab into a into a cesarean ot so that that would be your other alternative and you would prefer to do embolization every time or would you just wait at inflation and then go with internal ileus no first we'll deflate the balloon if if the bleeding continues they will embolize if the if the bleeding is stopped the, uh, and then you of course doing the triple procedure you devascularize the uterine artery and all then then uh, why then we will not embolize we can leave it but uh, i have uh, had one of these cases who had percreta and we took her to delhi uh, at gangaram and there uh, dr abha mazumdar uh, managed it and this was a case from agra a case uh, the minute i saw her i said my god this is a time bomb and that that is this is how we managed her she still bled uh, she still bled because we deflated the balloon did not embolize but day 5 of the operation she bled again and we had to open her up again and do the cesarean hysterectomy and then embolize she, we we could save her after massive blood transfusion but then that is where the deflating balloon and embolization decision will lie so that that the critical decision uh, you might later on uh, end up doing a major surgery again so it's better that you embolize and block the uterine valve you know your screen is blank again blank yes oh till that technology is sorted i just want to add we had one case in our institute of this kind of a situation of placenta previa where the uh, section was done no it's still blank and finally a, a, a small rim of cervix was left behind patient was otherwise stable pulse blood pressure was maintained but the hemoglobin kept dropping then we did a ct angiogram which showed a very slow leak and a gradual collection of a hematoma so this patient was then we don't have uh, in embolization in my hospital we sent her to km hospital which is our referral center they have done a embolization and patient so far has been saved and we we did not but this was a case where in fact i told that team they missed doing an internal iliac artery ligation if you have done a oh 
and you have left even a tiny bit of tissue behind, you have to ligate the internal iliac. Even if you feel pelvis, madam, pelvis was dry. We didn't do it. You need to no, do no, they should iliac still do it. They should coffee. still do it. Has they should still do it. Otherwise, the ladder will still be embraced. Yes, ma'am. We can see. We can see this. Yes, now we can see your screen. Okay. Is the video seen? This particular video? It's just yeah. a picture. It's a Let's picture. It's you can on the play. Click play. We're seeing a still. Still picture, the video is not running. Now? We are no. seeing you are injecting Petrus in somewhere. So the video is seen? No, no, no. no, no. It's just the needle replacing. Okay. It's just the needle we are seen going in the okay. You are doing so, something we don't know what. No, but the internet is slow, I think. All no, right. no, I think, I think this is a coronal ectopic and she is injecting Petrus in there. And okay. she's going to take this uh, Okay, I'll go for the next case. Can we see the screen now? You can see the screen with a I still picture. The picture. Will you change your case? Because now I think you have... No, no, I'm, going, I'm going to the next case, but this is the picture. Is The PowerPoint is not seen. I don't know why. The next slide, please. Yeah, I'm showing the next slide. One moment. One moment. One moment. Please. Okay, I'll share the screen once again. Okay. It uh, normally never happens like this. You are the techno savvy person. You talk. I know. <laughs> technology bhi daga de deti hai kabhi kabhi. <laughs> Ay, she's the one who taught me, you know, Zoom and everything. Okay. Is, the, is my screen seen now? Yeah, but it, nothing the is moving. The screen is seen, so... but it's a still picture. The different surgery. No. And I think that's a warning from heaven that we must not get rid of our skills. Technology can't be, yes. <laughs> be there all the time. I know, I know. We can't rely on technology all the time. In fact, the woman that's behind the machine is more important than the machine. So <laughs> The human element. Woman. <laughs> yeah, behind everything. With due respect to you, Chinmay, sorry. <laughs> Enjoying the nuance of the. We've had a very good time. Should we just um, uh, sort of. Kamino, why don't you just yeah, quickly go through the uh, case? We yeah. can do it without the slide. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. I'll go through the case without sharing the screen. Okay, I'll yeah. do that. Yeah. So that's again the like human element. Okay, let's, let's you just tell. We'll listen Even carefully. Visualize. Okay. We'll carefully listen, not only see the screen. Okay, okay. 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 let's see. Okay. okay. All right, just give me a second. Okay. All right. So second case is, I mean, just, just have to listen carefully now. Uh, one moment. Uh, okay. She's a 36-year-old, married mm -hmm. since seven years, male factor infertility, exceeded, conceived in second cycle with twin gestation. She went back to her hometown, Nasik. She had a preterm delivery at 34 weeks. Unfortunately, neonatal death of both the twins. She came back for IVF. Second cycle, we did a single embryo, single blastocyst transfer, which failed. Third cycle, we had two blastocysts. We counseled the patient. Uh, one was looking good, one was not looking so good. So we transferred both. She had a twin gestation uh, in this cycle now. What next? Okay, I'm out of this. <laughs> I'm out of this one. <laughs> I think I, I think Dr. Meenu, uh, ob your obvious worries are number one, the preterm delivery. Number two is the stillbirth. She had two problems in the past. And again, now you, you are you, again sitting on a time bomb with the same patient, similar story and the twin pregnancy. So I think you, you got to be really very, very uh, careful in this pregnancy. You have to do the counseling, number one. Number two, you have to look for the cervical length assessment in the first trimester and maybe you it might be good to offer her uh, you know uh, treatment for uh, if the cervical length is short so first and foremost important thing is here comes the role of technology though you can do a vaginal examination and can find out the short cervix but measuring the cervical length by ultrasound is a more uh, objective means of doing the cervical length assessment and offering her maybe a cervical suturing of course, you will rule out other causes of preterm birth, like if she had a twin discordancy because she left you. But uh, what everybody, uh -huh. So she might have twin discordancy, polyhydramnios or whatever. 
but mm-hmm. still like you have to begin from the first trimester and offer her uh, cervical length assessment and a good scanning in the first trimester would anybody talk about fetal reduction in this particular case uh, so minu i think here what is important is uh, first thing in that original pregnancy 34 weeks to lose both babies is little unusual and new center so first thing i would say ki you you deliver her yourself only and make sure she's at a good neonatal center that would be one of the things because uh, at 32 weeks plus in most centers across our country you should be able to salvage the uh, person another thing is fetal reduction of twins to singleton is a little tricky question but before that i would like to say there are two things uh, neither cervical cerclage nor routine use of progesterone has been shown to prevent preterm labor in twin gestation or higher multiple order pregnancies having said that that is one of the only things we have in our hands which is why we need to continue and with counseling consider i would in fact think of this is a person in whom i will continue progesterone which may uh, quiescent the uterus and uh, consider uh, that as one of the preventive measures which you can take along with as archana beautifully mentioned about regular uh, use of cervical screening preferably transvaginal to pick up cervical length or funneling or other changes which will make us vigilant okay but so we continue with this we have to be prepared to lose both the pregnancies also if it is going to happen and you yourself mentioned that out of the two blastocysts which you transferred one was not so healthy one uh, was uh, good so that is also a question if at all you want to do fetal reduction it's a very dicey situation and i would not be in favor of it so we continued this pregnancy twin pregnancy we continued with her now we uh, after counseling we gave her a prophylactic os tightening at around 15 weeks she comes back at 22 weeks with tifa scan with a funneling of the uh, cervix and short cervix now what next uh, anybody can answer what next to do for this particular patient 22 weeks twin pregnancy fundling uh, and short cervix and she already yes, has already cervical cervix right already cervical cerclage is there right it was done yes yes it was done already prophylactically ma'am it was done yes 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 yeah. so in many instances if you continue to use progesterone and advise her rest there is yeah. a good likelihood that the pregnancy will continue and the second thing is that i would really be concerned about the ultrasound quality that has been done because we need to have accurate assessment from a experienced ultrasound specialist and a transvaginal ultrasound to look for cervical um, uh, funneling and for the length of the cervix because in our practice many a times patient present to you with a cervical length of 25 and you give her rest and you give progestogens and the stitch is already there and you repeat the ultrasound after a month the cervical length is 42 so That's it true. means that the quality of ultrasound is of significant importance yes i am anybody would like to add anything else to this we repeat an ultrasound with another center okay just to have a second opinion we the findings are same she still has a funneling she has a short cervix what so, to do next counseling detailed counseling rest and continuation of progesterone that is my take okay sometimes uh, you know, would like to do something else for her yeah yeah there are two things which you can do in such cases nowadays there are some uh, you know rings th- those cups are available Pessary. which can be offered to women so that is a non surgical way of uh, you know helping with the preterm labor or sometimes what i have done in such cases i take the the patient again in operation uh, with the consent in ot and tighten the your previous uh, cervical suture you can just hold on to the previous suture either go above it or maybe you can tighten because it has gone loose due to the pressure uh, so that that has also helped in some cases though it's not been reported or something but it does help in the practice Okay. Uh, what about cervical um, abdominal cerclage? Right. Would uh, at any point any of you think about that? Because this is a last ditch effort now. So we this discussed with the patient. So yes, I, I agree with you. Is that going to sort of play in? So we discussed with the patient. We thought we have two options. One is to go uh, vaginally and give her a shirodka stitch. and you push the bladder up get a better length and give her a shirodka stitch second option was to go for a abdominal encerclage uh, patients were since they had already lost one set of twins they did not be also 
gave them the option of progesterone and bed rest. This, uh, so they, after giving all the counseling done, they opted for an abdominal encerclage. So we did a, in a 22 weeks twin pregnancy, we managed to do a good laparoscopic encerclage and place the stitch quite high up. Um, I actually have the video, I can share it with everyone. But uh, that is what I wanted to say. We can even do an open surgery or we open abdominal encirclage or a laparoscopic encirclage, abdominal encirclage. I think that has a good value in this particular, she's only 22 weeks uh, in this particular patient. The only uh, problem with this abdominal encirclage is suppose something happens during the pregnancy and you need to um, go in for a abdominal then you have to go for laparotomy. That is one thing or hysterotomy. And is one thing. Second thing is this patient also always have to go for a C-section, which is fine. Third thing is when we are doing a um, taking a stitch, uh, you have to be very, very, very careful because uh, the bleeding uh, is one thing we have to keep in mind. You cannot lift the uterus up. So you have to go posteriorly, place your instruments posteriorly, and you push the needle with a muslin tape posteriorly and take it out from the other end. Also make a, uh, make a window in the broad ligament so that you can go medial to the uterine artery and you have a space to rotate your needle holder through the window in the apartment into the, the so just a few points and uh, uh, I'm so sorry for the video why I'm not able Dr. to share Mindy, my screen. Mindy, uh, Mindy, what is important is what happened to this patient after your abdominal surclage. I agree. Has she pulled uh, on? Because surclage obviously yet. in twins has not been shown to be evidence-based. So I want to know what happened after the I will tell you because this is ongoing pregnancy. Uh, okay. I put this case now. She's, we just did it two weeks ago. So this is, I didn't want to actually talk about this case today because we want the patient to at least reach a uh, point of viability right. and uh, right. then talk about it. But today, since we had this particular panel, I thought I'll put this interesting. But the good news is she has not aborted or had a surgical okay, complication. She's, so she's gone very fine. Out, I would say. Yeah. 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 She would have had by now. So nothing yes. is going to happen That's now. Yeah. Doctor Minu, the point which we should, uh, you know, uh, bring out here, it is not very really easy to put in a laparoscope in a 22 weeks pregnant um, twin pregnancy. So it is not everyone's domain. It has to be done by very, very experienced and an expert person doing as such laparoscopic cervical suturing is not easy to handle by a, you know, level one or uh, level two laparoscopic surgeon. It has to be done by very, very expert surgeons. So uh, I think that's the message Like it should not be attempted unless you have experience of doing it and it's better to do an open. You can do an open surgery. But you have to be safety is the most important thing that you have to be safe rather than, uh, you know, putting women at risk. This is our third case. Uh, one case went till term. A bit, till term. Second case, uh, she aborted at around 26 weeks. We couldn't salvage the baby single fetus. And this is the third case that we have done. Uh, in the pregnant uterus. We can also do an interval encirclage. We had one patient who had come from Jaipur and uh, she had three, uh, two mid-trimester uh, 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 deliveries. And there was a, in, fa in fact, she was going to the medical college and the HOD had done a circlage for her and it didn't work. So we did an interval abdominal encirclage, laparoscopic, and then she continued uh, with the pregnancy and delivered at term. So this was just three or four cases that we have done. And uh, this particular case, I, I wanted to show the video because the video came out beautifully. So I thought I'd show this particular video, but I am not able to show. So I'm sorry for that. Can I just ask a quick question? Uh, no, do you put them on tocolytics afterwards or? Uh, no, you don't put them on tocolytics, not put them on, on progesterone or anything? We don't give tocolytics, we give them progesterone. Not, not long. What dose is that? Not for long. Yeah. We give them injectable progesterone, so a daily injection, along with the intravaginal, micronized intravaginal. So both of them we give. Okay. Are we uh, done, Dr. Aminu? And... Uh, can, uh, sort of Thank you so much, Archana, for the invitation and uh, Chinmay and Minu for this very uh, interesting panel discussion on behalf of all, pa all panelists. I think 
we are i'm happy that there are almost 100 participants still despite it being so late but uh, yeah. yeah thank you so much yeah thank you thank, thank you very, you very much. much thank you very much thank you sorry we, we were running late but it happens you know when um, there are lectures and um, panels so thank you very much all the panelists hmm. for being here and really uh, giving really great inputs so over to you dr menu yeah i thank all the panelists uh, very nice discussion and everybody came out with their experience and with their own what they are doing so this is the most practical part of the panel that we uh, we could come out with thank you chinmay for for the <laughs> for supporting and of course um, uh, thank you to sefoc team the entire sefoc team best zone you foxy and uh, dr archana basse to come out with such a wonderful program uh, hats off to you and uh, many many uh, lots of credits to dr arti evle and dr anshu basse a young brigade they are the future and you have to take uh, this forward so thank you very much everyone if i'm missing out somebody farmed people um, uh, yes academic partners uh, dr archana if i'm missing out anybody please uh, go ahead I, i think all the panelists were wonderful you know we really brought all the safog experience dr rubina dr lubna dr dorji dr reena dr narendra malhotra meenu dr um, chinmay i think everybody was excellent though we i'm really sorry that we are running little late but as reena said that there's a great interest from the participants and still we have uh, people uh, logged in so looking forward for many more interaction with all of you so thank you very much and uh, stay safe yeah can we have a little bit of word Yes, yeah 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 dr uh, you can have uh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, on behalf of the whole uh, uh, west zone uva organizing Dr. team i want to thank uh, uh, the safog uh, members uh, the organizing team and the foxy uh, especially uh, dr ashna besser who was uh, uh, really a very great helping hand to organize and include uh, this uh, in uh, our uh, west zone uva foxy uh, program Uh, i also want to thank uh, uh, the academic partner farmed for this and a special thanks to um, the the mocs dr anju basher and dr arti i want to thank on behalf of the whole eva foxy uh, west zone organizing team this is dr vipul kapadia and i am really thankful to all of you for a very very lovely and uh, highly academic program that you uh, put together thank you very much and i uh, uh, have you yeah, i wish you all have very safe times and good night thank you dr kapadia dr gajar and dr kasbe wala for really giving us this slot to do this workshop in west zone uva foxy thank you very much Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Bye. Good night. Bye good for night. now. Thank you, Doctor. Good night. Bye bye. All the effort. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.